Good evening, fellow heretics. Welcome to uh, episode six of Nerds and Heresy uh, with Captain Dadpool and my co-host, Crimson Barrel. Tonight's guest of honor is the one and only Hyperhumanity. Um, he's come in. We're going to have a conversation about Gnosticism, and uh, I'm going to give the floor to him for about 10 minutes or so uh, so he can plug himself and tell us you know, who, who he is and what he's up to these days. So floor is yours, Hyper. All right, what's up, guys? I'm Hyper Humanity. You guys know me from TikTok. Um, I'm known for talking about the ancient religion of Gnosticism. I'll first introduce myself and talk a little bit about my background. I grew up on the West Coast in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I had no religious background. I grew up in kind of a religious family, a Christian family, because people always ask me about it. But until I was about 18, I never believed in God, never believed in Jesus, wasn't an atheist, just religion really wasn't on my radar. I just kind of was cruising, chilling, and living life. When I turned 18, 19, and I went to college, that's when kind of a light switch went, a light switch kind of went off in my life. And I started my freshman year, I majored actually in religion. I studied the Old Testament from a Jewish rabbi, and I took Christian courses from a guy who was getting a PhD in Christian theology. After my freshman year in college, religion kind of left me empty. It gave me no answers. I was like, these guys are all just compliant, trying to just you know, explain a first century book with no actual truth in it. So I left my religion major as a freshman and as, and as a sophomore, I became a philosophy major. And I started studying ancient philosophy, modern philosophy, Greek philosophers, Frederick Nietzsche, you know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Hegel, all of the mix, you know, Descartes says, I think therefore I am. And that's what kind of really started my journey to finding Gnosticism, which wasn't a fairy tale mythos based religion, but it was actually religion based on knowledge. It was about pursuing truth. And for a Gnostic, when you look at like a like the Bible, fairy tales, there's no truth. There's not a single true statement in the Bible to a Gnostic, right? Because the Bible is written to hint at what truth could be. It's up to you to understand what could these texts be meaning. For us, the whole Bible is a metaphor. God himself in the Bible would be a metaphor. So I, you know, I pursued I started studying Gnosticism at about age 20. I've been studying it for about eight to nine years now. And I graduated with a philosophy degree with a concentration on critical thinking. So I studied a lot of morality, a lot of the philosophy of science, which is super intriguing, and just a bunch of logic and reason. So now I'll get into a little bit about what is Gnosticism. So Gnosticism means gnosis, which translates into knowledge. So what's the difference between mainstream Christianity and what Gnosticism is because they were major competitors and Christianity eradicated right Gnosticism because they were so opposed to the modern day religion. Well, why? Wouldn't you be curious to find out? So Gnostics were knowers. Christians are blind faith believers. So for a Gnostic, you eat the apple in the tree of garden. Christianity wants to burn the tree of knowledge down, right? Yahweh proclaims in the Bible in Proverbs 9.10, that true knowledge begins with the fear of God, not at the tree of knowledge. So for a Christian, you can never know the truth. The truth is forbidden. Gnosticism, we were always supposed to be heretics. We were always supposed to be nonconformist free thinkers. That was the whole point. It rose up in opposition to Christianity, which was a, a religion of slavery. So as a Gnostic, it's our journey to discover what is true and to deconstruct these fairy tale religions, you know, that we saw that were ancient Gnostics believe these religions were made by Yahweh, who they called the devil or the Demiurge, um, who was the evil creator God. And these religions were created to fear humans. Don't pursue knowledge, right? Don't question the religion. Everybody in these religions must conform and be compliant. Nobody, there can be no heresies. There can be no different interpretations. When you see mistranslations, just shut up and stay in your lane and don't question anything. The Bible is the divinely inspired word of God. Nobody can question anything. Yet this all-knowing, all-powerful God said the world was flat. He said the sun revolved around the moon. So the ancient Gnostics looked at Yahweh and said, Yahweh is an idiot. Yahweh doesn't even know how the world was created. So he honestly can't be the creator God. He's an imposter. Yahweh calls himself the creator of the universe. Yet he has a father called El Elyon. So Yahweh can't be God. It's actually impossible because he comes from El. So the Gnostics knew all this and they saw all this going down in the, you know, the first and second and third centuries of the Catholic Church trying to heavily edit and change the Bible. And they saw a conspiracy that was going on in the religion where they were taking the truth and knowledge and they were suppressing it and trying to create a religion that, you know, would enslave people. So 
as a Gnostic, you know, it's it's your it's your job to break through the Bible. We see that Yahweh is jealous, angry, hateful. You know, in Genesis 3:22, humans are in the Garden of Eden. It literally says in the Bible, when they ate from the tree of knowledge, humans have equal morality of good and evil and moral authority as God. So what objective moral reality is are the Christians or the Abrahamic religions talking about when Genesis 3:22 says humans have equal moral authority as God? They're simply rejecting their own scripture. And the Bible goes on in Genesis 3.22 to say that if, if humans reached out and ate from the tree of life, then they'll be immortal. So the Gnostics looked at the Bible and saw Yahweh was Satan, which is just a, a word for the adversary of the human race. He's the deceiver. So, you know, in life, it's, it's our job to, you know, as scientists, as mathematicians or philosophers or people of reason and logic and truth seekers, to peel through the illusionary, you know, fairy tales of life and find out what is really true. And at the end of the day, that's kind of the sacred journey of the Gnostic is, you know, living a life in pursuit of the truth. So I will end it on that note. Cool. All right. Can we just make that the show, though? Can you just go on for another two hours? Like, <laughs> I'm going to keep going. I thought I was talking too much, so I, I stopped. I, no, it's I, mean, I could hear you talk for a long time and, and not get bored. So. For sure. I, I, would, um, I wouldn't be opposed to that. So that's interesting, though, that you uh, um, you bring up. So we, we talked about that before, and it kind of cracks me up. The reason that Mormonism kind of adheres to certain Gnostic beliefs is simply because they stole those beliefs from the Masons, not even Christianity. And you you mentioned, you said... Um, uh, uh, or what was it that they that they ignore it like oh there's mistranslations you got to kind of bury your head in the sand and pretend like they don't exist um i get that i get that every day uh mm -hmm. i had somebody uh, uh ask they said if uh why are you comparing morality from 2000 years ago to morality today and, and the answer is because christians like they pretend at having objective morality that comes from the bible that comes from god and it's like it clearly doesn't because if you read the bible God's kind of a prick. Like, I, so I just, you know, I don't understand how people can kind of like just cover their eyes to that. They just don't, they don't even read the book. And, and that goes into why Gnosticism was eradicated because we were the heretics. We, I mean, people say Gnosticism is a forbidden text, but the real, the truth is it was always forbidden. That was the, that was the message. We are forbidden because we're going against the world. It's the contra mundum. We're against the world, right? We're against the creator God. So we were, we were literally, Gnosticism was a movement revealing what was fake in the Bible. That's what the whole movement was. All these different interpretations of the gospel of Jesus and different religions. It was eradicating the Catholic Church, which was obviously using, you know, the Bible for evil. And they were just, Gnostics were just truth seekers. They didn't care where the truth led them. If it led you to atheism, great. If it didn't, if it led you to theism, then great. You go where the truth goes. That, yeah, the, uh, the Gnosis idea of is growing closer to God is is by gaining knowledge, uh, and not by how uh, strictly you adhere to a certain set of rules, which is you know what the Catholic Church and early Church uh, wanted. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 interesting um, to see that such a great effort made into snuffing out uh, the Gnostic teachings, uh, and they were almost successful. Like it, they were, it was almost completely gone, erased from history. Uh, for a while, um, so they're they're pretty had a lot of success in that area. I've got a working theory going that, um, despite being named Jesus, Christ was supposed to be Emmanuel. He was supposed to be not the son of Yahweh, but the son of Elion, which is why he sort of, kind of, like to an extent, preached like love and kindness and tolerance. Like Christians want to hate homosexuals. Jesus never said a word about homosexuality, uh, uh, condemned taxpayers or not tax, sorry, tax collectors and never homosexuals. Um, love your enemy, turn the other cheek. That's very counterintuitive to the do, Old Testament God. Do good like, deeds in secret. You know, murder your enemies and enslave them. Numbers 31 uh, against the Medianites, just as an example. So I have that kind of, I, I'm, it's a slow process I'm kind of working on. I really think that uh, uh, to that extent you could consider Jesus Gnostic. Um, I also think that I, I, the Druids technically fall under that. So like the Druids knew that the earth was round 
you know, probably close to about the time the Greeks figured it out, maybe a little earlier, they had um, stone circles that counted as star charts. Um, New Grange in Ireland's a fascinating part of that history where um, at the winter solstice every year, they timed it out, the rising sun hits it and illuminates it. Um, but they, you know, they're, the word Druid means oak keeper and it also like ties into like the, the keepers of knowledge to that extent. Um, which is why I don't get along with Druids today, because they talk about, you know, our gods and, and honoring our gods. The Druids were responsible for the gods fucking leaving in Celtic mythology. People need to remember that, I think. But anyway, sorry, tangent. Um, um, so, yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> on that, the, the Gospel of Judas, which is a Gnostic gospel, which I don't necessarily share the perspective of the Gospel of Judas, but in the Gospel of Judas, Jesus... Uh, tells the 12 disciples and the name for Yahweh in this gospel is Soclis, which translates into fool. Uh, the Demiurge translates into evil creator God. And, and then there's Yabaladeo, or some, if I pronounce that wrong, translates into um, evil. And so Soclis, Jesus tells the 12 disciples that Soclis is a bloody rebel and a fool. And in the gospel of Judas, they... Uh, the disciples laugh at Jesus and they disagree and they don't understand. And Jesus goes, you guys are worshiping an evil demigod, a bloody fool. Right. And they don't, they don't understand. And so in the gospel of Judas, Jesus goes to Judas and goes, you're the only one who's going to know the secret here. And that's that all the 12 disciples are worshiping Yahweh, the evil bloody fool, and nobody understands. So you're going to carry my secret with me. And he says in the gospel of Judas, the whole modern day Christian religion is all going to go down the wrong route and the wrong road, worshiping the wrong evil God. So that along your line of saying that Jesus might have been Gnostic, it, it kind of aligns with that theory. You know, that is interesting because, so there's Satan, which like e even in the Hebrew and its original intent, Satan is an aspect of Yahweh. Like that's an incontestable. It's sort of like the antithesis to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's supposed to be your conscience. The Satan's supposed to be your desires. It's what tempts the Israelites to sin. But the Satan is Samael. That's the devil. And he's just doing his job. Like he was created to be the angel of death, to be like who tempts mortals. So it's that's another interesting thought that like Judas had to betray Jesus for him to be crucified. So Did you was he sort of fulfilling something that he was there to do? So in the Gospel of Judas, Gnostics were were completely opposite of modern day Christianity. The, the the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was irrelevant. The point of Gnosticism was salvation through knowledge to ascend from the physical realm and go back to the what they called the plumeroma, the plumeroma, which was the heavenly the heavenly realm, the spiritual realm. So the goal was to die. And as Jesus, Jesus was a prototype of what anybody else could do. Everybody had a soul and a body. So Jesus was like, look. You can activate the God within you and become man, God, and ascend to heaven through salvation, which is achieved through knowledge. Everyone has this ability. So there was no bow, worship, pray. Jesus is some Messiah coming back on judgment day. So in the gospel of Judas, Judas, Jesus goes to Judas in private and says, I need you to go turn me into the Romans because I need, I need to die. I need to be killed so I can leave to heaven. If not, the devil's going to come back and get me and there's going to be problems. So in the gospel of Judas, Jesus dies on purpose so he can leave and go back to heaven before the devil comes down because he sees him as a, you know, in the Bible, it says Jesus sees Satan fall from the heavens like a, a shooting light, right? So Jesus tells Judas on purpose to turn them in so he can ascend. And in Gnosticism, there is no resurrection. It's irrelevant because we're not saved through Jesus's death. We're saved through knowledge. And if you don't pursue knowledge, you're not saved. You got to do it yourself. Everyone is their own Messiah in, in a sense. That, so that, but that just, I mean, that ties back to like, though, even in the concept of like Christian dogma as it exists currently without like separation from Gnosticism, like if Jesus had to die, for your sins by Christian dogma, then Judas had to turn him in. So that's exactly. that. I, I just think that that's interesting from that perspective. All hail like, Judas, our savior. Too. <laughs> All hail Judas. Um, apparently, I missed the ticker, but uh, turn down for what? There you go. Drink. You got a screwdriver up there, Crimson. Yes, vodka. Vodka and pineapple, pineapple orange juice. It's delicious. Yeah, usually when I throw up, I, I, I'm, I'm mad at how not bad it tastes too. So, 
um, oh, I had a, um, an interesting talk earlier. So that's, uh, uh, we can get into that though, as far as like the desire for knowledge or the, the, um, the need for knowledge, like that concept, if you look at Genesis one and two as separate as Genesis one being sort of the parallel to the Enuma Elish, uh, and then Genesis 2, not being the creation of the world, but being the creation of the garden and of Adam and Eve as the first Israelites by Yahweh, then the serpent in that story, for, for a number of reasons, the serpent is Asherah, but she provides Adam and Eve knowledge. She's like, Yahweh's keeping you ignorant for some ulterior purpose. I'm telling you the truth about the fruit. It's not going to kill you. It's going to give you the knowledge of good and evil. You'll be as the gods or as everyone else essentially mm -hmm. um, you guys are on point in the comments by the way <laughs> what happened in the comment i'm just just reading the comments like there we, we got some funny shit happening in the comments so i appreciate you <laughs> um uh, like the v-neck uniforms wiener schnitzel i'm not wearing a v-neck though it's, it's my mine is sorry um, hyper mine, mine's not the, Go ahead, but sorry. That, yeah the the snake then is a giver of knowledge a, a giver of truth as opposed to Yahweh's clearly lying. because, And I, I get people like, oh, they died spiritually. Oh, a day to the Lord is a thousand years, and Adam died 900 years later. It's like, first off, no, he didn't. Secondly, yeah. uh, uh, they, he said they were going to die that same day, and they don't die. So, and it's like the snake is even like, uh, he doesn't want you to have it because then you'll have the knowledge of good and evil. You'll be as the gods. And then yeah. the Elohim literally says, behold, now man is as one of us, knowing good and evil. Yep. Yeah, so how Gnosticism, Gnosticism explains that is in the heavens before the universe was created, it, heaven is in perfect harmony, right? Everything is perfect. It's pure light and pure perfection. It's an immaterial, mathematical, perfect domain. And then Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, who is equivalent to Astra in the Canaanite pantheon, in the, in the heaven, she gets bored of heaven because, I mean, you're in heaven for an eternity. So, I mean, you're experiencing bliss okay, forever. Yeah. So Sophia has this... Oh, there we go again. <laughs> I want to point out the drinking game is we have to try and figure out what the word is or phrase is. Oh, we don't know what the word is? No, we only we I, my oh, girlfriend okay. is running the stream. Okay. Uh, That's good information. She, she picks it and we just have to try and figure it out. So so the snake in the story of Adam and Eve is Sophia, the goddess of wisdom. Um, in Gnosticism, they're all obviously polytheistic. There's El Elyon and there's Sophia, the goddess of wisdom. The divine feminine completely harmonizes the divine masculine. This was always the way it was supposed to be. This is why El Elyon was married to Astra, because it was perfect harmony. The queen of heaven was married to the king of heaven. Then the Abrahamic religions through the Jewish and the Israelites completely eradicated and demonized Astra or Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, as Gnosticism, as how we explain this, is this is the dialectics of the Hungarian logic of good versus evil. Sophia is the divine wisdom. Gnostics say the goddess is within and the god is without. So Christians externalize God and worship an exterior masculine male God, and they reject the teachings of Christ, which say the kingdom of heaven and God is within. Well, that's the goddess, Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, of intelligence, of, of the eternal mind, of knowledge. Yahweh is the evil exterior physical, right? In the Bible, heaven is physical. It's supposed to be a new earth. There's no talk of spirituality or immaterialism. So the Gnostics viewed Yahweh as almost the antithesis to Sophia, who's the thesis. And there's a, a, an eternal conflict. Yahweh is controlling humans. Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, comes down through the tree of knowledge and one-ups Yahweh or the Demiurge and gives humans knowledge. Well, knowledge is a product of the divine feminine, the queen of heaven. And there's a conflict of a, a war going on here through human evolution of, you know, faith versus knowledge, you know, so to speak. That's yeah, so I, I like to point out uh, that when after they partook of the fruit and, and received that knowledge of good and evil, they, they immediately became afraid. Like that was the first emotion that they felt was fear for for uh, El or God. Um, so they hid from him because they knew they were going to be punished for gaining this knowledge. And then, of course, God did find them uh, and then punish them as well as everyone else who would be born from that moment on. Uh, so, yeah, um, you're correlating. Sophia to Asherah too. I, yes. That's interesting, and I want to talk about that, um, especially because there's there's a number of psalms that talk about Sophia and refer to her as the tree of life. And then in um, the Gospels and in Corinthians, Jesus is referred to as the tree of life and is 
uh, uh, considered wisdom, like called Sophia in Greek. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of like the basis for my, like where I really want to piss off the Christians. I tell them Jesus was the goddess Sophia before manifesting on earth as a man. So Jesus is a trans male, by the way. And uh, uh, that's really interesting, though, to correlate Sophia to Asherah. Because if the snake is supposed to be Sophia as well, or the concept of the snake giving them wisdom, giving them knowledge, yep. and you compare that to Sophia and Asherah, and Asherah is El's wife in the Canaanite pantheon. Uh, uh, so that, yeah, the divine feminine, that, there's a whole thing there where people want to kind of like correlate that to the Holy Spirit instead of Jesus. Everybody drink! Turn oh. down for what? It's not... It's not Asherah, is it? It can't be Asherah. Yeah, and um, divine. In, in, in Bible college, they tell you that the Elohim refers to the Trinity, because like they, they don't shy away from the fact that it's plural. So like this this is talking about the Trinity. This is the Old Testament or evidence in the Old Testament of the Trinity. And so, I, I always had a problem with that, but I never looked into it. And now that I'm an atheist and I'm I'm gaining all this knowledge outside of my formal education, I'm like that makes so much sense like the, I'm, I'm learning the answers to all the questions i had with when i was you know going through bible college that nobody else could answer um i had somebody yeah. recently right. ask they're like if elohim is supposed to be plural why is the verb for created bara is singular it's like okay well if you were to say me and my friends are going out sunday versus my family is going out sunday the verb is to be is singular, he is, she is, you know, versus R is plural. That's a collective noun. So even though it is plural, it's treated as a singular noun. Um, but that, you know, tell tell a Jewish person that Elohim is fucking plural because of the Trinity. Watch them laugh in your face. Like that's that irritates me more than anything else is Christians trying to like rewrite the Old Testament and Hebrew to fit trinitarian narrative because it doesn't make any fucking sense i have a quick question on that because in the bible there's two creation stories genesis 1 says elohim created the heavens and the earth and in genesis i think it's 2 7 god created humans in his image so in genesis 1 the elohim creates humans in their image which is plural and then in genesis 2 uh, if I'm correct, because I looked up the Hebrew, it says Yahweh, but it also says El. So I, I, I figured it says God creates humans out of dust in their image. And I'm like, there's almost a double creation story here. There, There's the 100 percent double. So um, and Deadpool's brought this up before. And then I made a video that goes into like how exactly it parallels. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1 is the Enuma Elish retold in simpler terms. Um, the separation of the waters of heaven versus the waters of earth, that is the story of Absu and Tiamat, the <laughs> primordial waters being separated. When Absu dies, his corpse is used to create land masses, so that's the earth. When Tiamat dies, her corpse is used to create the skies, so that's the waters of heaven. Um, so that's all that Genesis 1 is, is a complete retelling, a shortened, condensed, um, sort of uh, uh, vague retelling of the Enuma Elish. And then Genesis 2, it does say that he creates, like, oh, there's no plants on earth because God hadn't sent rain down. And then it's like, okay, now I'm going to form all of the animals of the land, all the birds, all of the land animals, and Adam's going to name them all. That, if you just kind of take that aspect and you're like, okay, it's even if this were supposed to be a retelling of Genesis 1, it's out of order. It's wrong. So mm -hmm. kind of like erase that thought process and just see it as the creation of the first Israelites, of Yahweh's chosen people, right? Um, so, I, you know, th there's, there's more than two even. There's another creation story that's in Job that doesn't fit Genesis 1 or Genesis 2. And Job is the mm -hmm. first book, not, not canonically, but uh, um, chronologically, the first book of the Bible that was written was Job. Accurate. Yep. Um, which is why it contains its own creation story. I wanted to comment really quick to go back a step. You mentioned the female Christ. And there, one of the Gnostic Gospels actually positions Christ as a female Christ. And there's actually a book written by a guy called Dr. Anthony Harris called The Sacred Virgin and the Holy Whore, who actually positions Jesus Christ as a female yeah. who suffers from Turner syndrome, where uh, she has a, ma a rather masculine appearance, yet is yet Jesus is actually a female. And in John 13, 20, 
three, right? In the in the famous um, when they're sitting at the you know the table and they're, 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 the painting is there, Jesus has the disciple who is matching him, and the painting is the Last Supper, and he's matching, right? And in Gnostic terms, we see this as either two ways: either Jesus was a female and had a lover, because, or Jesus was possibly gay and had a male lover. Because there's also another Gnostic gospel that kind of portrays Jesus as being a homosexual because his most beloved disciple is John. And Jesus has a very intimate relationship with supposedly a man. So, and this, of course, would be heresy to the Catholic Church. So maybe there was a cover up of Jesus possibly not being who we think. People always talk about the historic Jesus must always be right. Irrefutably, there's no questions asked. Well, not exactly, because we can look back and see a bunch of irregularities, you know, of, of different Jesus is being portrayed. Oh, that's hilarious for a bunch of reasons. Uh, uh, so the Masons have known that for a while, right? And so I love this story. This is my favorite, like, biblical, like, I mean, it's extra biblical. But so King James of the King James Bible was a gay man. He was married to a oh, woman yeah. because he had to be because he was a king. But his lover was George Villiers, who he made Duke of Buckingham. And he made, you know, however many royal honors he could give him. And the Church of England tried to be like, you need to stop being gay. And he said, and I quote, Jesus had John, I have George. Hilarious. That to me that they're so very homophobic, despite the fact that Jesus never said a word about homosexuality. And the book that most of them are like purists about, like this is the book you have to follow. This is the best translation. No, the fuck isn't. It, like, it honors a gay man on the cover. Yep. <laughs> I just, I find that deliciously ironic. Yeah, there, there's a lot to unpack there. And there's a lot of Bible verses. There was also in the Gospel of St. Philip, it portrayed Jesus as being married to Mary Magdalene, right? They called they called the disciple Mary Magdalene. And the, it, the Gospel of St. Philip, the Gnostic Gospel, is heavily biased, almost guaranteed. I mean, it's just him being, Jesus being married to Mary Magdalene is all over. Jesus had two kids. Four of the disciples were his brothers. Judas was his younger brother. You know, so there's this whole other side. And the conspiracy was if Jesus was, in fact, God incarnate, can't have a wife, can't have kids, can't have a family. God can't have a family. Right. So there's here. Here's another position of a Nazi gospel of Christians, probably in the tens of thousands who thought Jesus was married, had kids, had brothers, was just a normal, average, everyday guy. And yet these people were killed and their, their books were erased. Ricky brought this up before, um, and it, it ties to Avalonian uh, um, mythology, like the way that England thought of Jesus, the whole concept of uh, the Holy Grail being the bloodline of Christ. Um, I lost my train of thought. There was something that correlated there, sorry, that, that uh, um, you made a video on that was about probably not – hold on, hold on. Mary Magdalene, sorry. So Mary Magdalene mm -hmm. isn't actually a whore. Um, the whole concept of like the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Thomas depicting Jesus's life as being married and having kids, that's the whole thing, is that rabbis of the time had to be married. You couldn't be a teacher and be a single, like a bachelor. Uh, so it just didn't make any sense for Jesus to be considered like a single man. But more importantly, like Mary Magdalene, not a whore, like a shipping Harris, that they treated as a whore, that they changed the wording to, to distance her from Christ as much as possible. So it's they like, did. if she wasn't a prostitute, that would like make more sense that Jesus would be married to her. So let's call her a prostitute. Let's put her low, lowest you can be as a human to them in their eyes, sex work is real work, to sort of like make that Asher. divide. It's the same as how they like separated Yahweh from Asherah to be like, Yahweh's not married to Asherah, which he wasn't. That was just religious syncretism merging Yahweh I've to heard El, that before. People, people on the video response claim Yahweh was married to Asherah, not El, and I'm like, that's just not right, you know? Yeah, not, not married, just had children I mean, that together. Would be, that would be weird. The, the, yeah, that would be weird. I mean, it wouldn't be unexpected in Christianity, I mean, you know, but that would be weird in real life. Um, the Mormons believe that. The Mormons believe that Yahweh is married to Asherah, but, like, wrote her out of the Bible, essentially. Because they, they're like the excuse is that oh God didn't want people to take her name in vain the way that they would his. He didn't want them to curse her, which people say mother of God all the time. So, I mean, referring to the Virgin Mary, but still, it, like I think that's hilarious. Uh, um, I keep saying that. I need to stop saying that. Um, 
<laughs> just that, like, it's starting to sound weird. It's just a thing that you say. Um, I don't know. I wanted to get into uh, um, that distinction, the the whole concept, because a lot of what you're saying does make sense and, and uh, from a perspective is valid, but then, like, Elohim in in uh, um, the context of Genesis 1 being Elyon and not his children. Uh, um, again, as far as that relates to the Enuma Elish, um, and that's, I think that we haven't gotten into that yet, but the, the concept of the Demiurge, so the physical world being like evil versus mm -hmm. uh, um, this, you know, the good God, the separate being that is outside of the universe and it's unaware of the physical world. That is fascinating to me. And I've been learning about that recently for not. Yeah. So, so is that like, like theism? I guess it. Oh, everybody oh, drink. Down for what? Oh, I'm out. Oh, really? I'll, I'll notionally drink. It's that's delicious. I think the word, but I think I know what the word is, but I don't want to say it. Oh no! Tell us. It's not. Uh... Well, the the funny thing about the the creation myth in in Gnosticism, you know, goes again. Like I said earlier, you know, heaven was a perfect harmony, and then Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, broke the harmony. And she had a child. And when you have a child, in according to Gnostic mythology, you're supposed to do it in harmony. So your Astra was supposed to have a child with L, but instead she went and did it by herself. So she did it out of harmony. And when she had a child, it was the demiurge, and it was an abomination. It it, it was it was chaos, evil, darkness. It was it was a mistake, an abortion. And so Sophia throws the demiurge away as far as she can from heaven, right? Get it out of here. I don't want anyone to know that I just messed everything up. And then the demiurge like explodes into the big bang and creates this physical universe of an illusionary physical world of darkness and confusion and lies. And he, the demiurge never has been in heaven because he wasn't born in heaven. So the reason why the Bible is always physical is because the demiurge has no knowledge, right? The Bible says the devil, there is no truth within him. He does not know the truth. He is the deceiver. He's full of lies because he doesn't actually have the knowledge. The demiurge himself needs to be saved by Sophia, the goddess of wisdom or Lucifer, because the demiurge is ignorant. He leads the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews along the path of hatred, anger, evil, and jealousy. He leads the blind. It's the blind leading the blind. So the demiurge is the ignorant God who created humans inferior, trapped in physical bodies, um, yet we have this divine spark within us. We have the kingdom of heaven and God within us. And through the, you know, the Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, we can all, you know, ascend back to our, that insatiable drive we have inside us to become perfect again someday and to return to the divine spark of, you know, the plamora or heavens. If Sophia is Jesus incarnate as mortal, that makes Jesus the father of God. Or the mother, I should say. Yeah, in a sense, yeah. God, that's trippy. I love that. I need to. I so I have a book list in my bio that's a bunch of like the origins of Abrahamism and the Canaanite pantheon. I need to get some books on Gnosticism. You got a couple recommendations? I, I have one right here. This is a really called. good one. This is called uh, what's this called? Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, the bride of God. And this is written by kind of a, this is written by a pagan. But this this book, Sophia, the Goddess of Wisdom, the Bride of God, will is one of the top books you can read about Sophia, and it talks a lot about her and what it means and how the wisdom is. It has the quote in there, you know, the goddess is within, God is without. You know, the, the Sophia can 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 bring the world back to logos. You know, Carl Jung, who was I got another book here called The Gnostic Jung. Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, was a Gnostic, and he wrote in his book that Sophia was the Logos itself. It was the immaterial eternal mind. And if the world can move away from the Demiurge, the Christian God, and turn towards Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, pure intellect and pure science, humans can return to their divine state and we can build a heaven and paradise on earth. And the only thing stopping us is worshiping the evil, deceptive Demiurge, the God of lies. What was the name of the author for that book? Yeah, which one? Uh, Sophia, the Bride of God. Yeah, Catalina Matthews. Love that. That's that's a whole fucking thing. Oh, that was a big money in the comments. I think it's uh, um, your it's a wife. Huge bitch. He asked, huh? Oh, that's a that's a huge bitch. He said fuck Mary, kill Sophia, Yahweh, Asherah. <laughs> uh, 
uh, just having some fun. Uh, I, I agree with that. Yeah, that's, that's Mary, good. Sophia, kill Yahweh, and fuck Asherah, I guess. Uh. <laughs> what? That's, that's such a weird fucking thing to put in the comments. <laughs> what is Rachel doing? What? No, that was me. That was you? Oh, I thought that yeah. she was fucking with your shit. I'm not, I'm not getting to talk a lot this episode, Ricky. so I'm just over here putting shit in the comments. I'm shit posting in, in the comments. No, it's um, it's fine. This the, the truth. Like Gnosticism is outside of my wheelhouse. Um, it's, it's something I'm just recently started learning about. So uh, don't expect a whole lot of input from me. It's it's not my area. Um, and all three of us kind of talk about the uh, the polytheistic origins of uh, uh, um, Abrahamism, and we can kind of go over that. I think for for a, a good part of this this talk just because it kind of come up a lot and so we could be like go watch this episode of our podcast and stop asking me questions uh yeah, right. so we're, we're throwing out a lot of names that if people haven't been watching our content they might not know what the fuck we're talking about so in the bible god has however many names that are now in english translated to mean god and in hebrew kind of taken to mean god but in the original language and the original intent do not refer to the Christian, Jewish, Muslim God. They don't refer to Yahweh. They don't refer to Allah. They refer to El Elyon and his children, the 70 sons of God, the Elohim. The Elohim were the gods and goddesses of canon, which is where Judaism comes from. Judaism is a product of Canaanite polytheism. It started as Yahwism, which was the cult of Yahweh. Um, Yahweh himself in this sort of pantheon didn't exist as a son of Elion. He was in a, a, a carryover from the Shasu nomads. And there are two places in the Bible that specifically refer to Yahweh coming from Sitar, uh, which is where the Shasu nomads are from. So he it, originally he way W H W Y instead of Y H W H. He way is a storm deity that was just brought into the Canaanite pantheon and called Elohim to sort of establish his godhood, to, to validate him as a god. Um, the, and that's, if you read it with that understanding, if you read the Bible with that understanding in Hebrew and you see however many times it refers to Elohim, you're like, okay, is this Yahweh or is this a different one of the Elohim? Because there are however many. Um, so Elion being the father, Asherah's the mother, Yahweh is a spiritual child of sorts. Then there's the Baals, Baals, Abul, Baal, Hadid, uh, um, Betel, um, Halel ben Sahar, who Christians refer to as Lucifer. That's incorrect. And he's not even really a character in the Bible. He's mentioned one time in Isaiah 14, 12, and never again. And because it references the fall, which is Atar in the Baal cycle, Atar being another one of the Elohim, that one fucking line has rewrote all of demonology and like Satanism and the concept of Satan, the concept of the devil for Christians, not, not Jewish folk. That that's fucking ridiculous to me that there's one verse that mentions Lucifer. And now everybody's got this fucking red horny dude in their head because of things like paradise loss and the divine comedy. Are we still doing phrasing? He's not even actually a fucking character in the Bible. <laughs> He's not, because even that context, even as Halal ben Sahar, that's just poetic language that refers to the king of Tyre and references the, the fall of Atar because that's something that they knew about. It was a metaphor, and that rewrote all of fucking the, the dogma for Christianity, that so, one fucking line. Yeah, so I have something to say on that. As a Gnostic, we often refer to Gnosticism, you know, as myth, as actual fairy tales. Even the Gnostic Gospels aren't truth. As a Gnostic, you actually pursue logic and reason. But Gnosticism is the psychoanalysis of the mind of God. And religion is an actual look into the evolution of the human human psyche and how it evolved. So when we see a character like Lucifer start evolving in new mythologies, we see heresy something. Oh, is that it? Did I say it? No, no, no. Just, just heresy detected. 
She's um, having fun over there. So just take so, so yeah. So the point is, is that you know, because in Gnosticism, we feel like religion is a reflection of what the collective human humans of the generation think. If humans think, you know, this, they they invent this sort of religion. If they think they need to be saved, they want a messiah. It's a reflection of the collective and the majority of the humans. So Lucifer evolves as this deity of light who comes and saves humans because people feel like they need to be saved by something. They need a savior. They need light and truth. They crave for it because they live in a world of darkness and evil and nihilism and confusion and nobody knows what's going on. And so what we see is the rise of Lucifer, this savior of light from the heavens who comes down and dies for humans. And it's a love story and everyone is captivated by it. So, you know, there's, there's this sense of like humans have this insatiable drive for knowledge and Lucifer is like, just the externalized embodiment of Lucifer is just a symbol for your crave of knowledge, but it's a, it's an evolution in religion. It's kind of how a Gnostic would portray that. And that's why we see that evolving. You'll love this because Josiah Cito in the comments is asking about the host of rebel angels. Um, and that references one line from revelation and it's about the great dragon who is that ancient serpent and his angels. So just real quick, Angels, not a thing. Uh, um, that is a Greek word that is, it, it references the Hebrew word malakwa, which is, or malak, sorry, which is messenger. So the Greek word is angelos, and that's where we get angels from. But they're not a separate divine race. They are just another tier of Elohim, which is why most of the angels that you hear about, the last part of their name is El. Raphael, Michael, Uriel, Samael. The, the host of the rebel angels, the leader, the dragon, would then be Sophia or Asherah. And that's the thing about the serpent. So, like, what was the serpent's punishment? So, Yahweh didn't know that the serpent was Satan, right? Doesn't refer to the serpent as Satan, never says that it's an angel. And what people think, because in the descriptions of the fall and the descriptions of these kings, is that they were Sherebim who guarded Eden. So, like, oh, that proves that that's Satan. No, the fuck it does. But... So that, that, that would be then the leader of the rebel angels is yeah, Asherah, yeah. is Sophia, the dragon, yeah. because the serpent's punishment was that it would crawl on its belly. Yahweh took away its wings. It was a dragon. Yeah. The name Asherah even means she who rides the sea dragon, and the great dragon is described as a leviathan. So. And it, it, it's a huge Gnostic symbol that we're fallen angels or fallen gods, and we must get our wings back and ascend back to heaven. So there's this idea that even Sophie, the goddess of wisdom, the most beautiful, because the most beautiful God wouldn't be Lucifer, a man. It would be Sophia, the goddess of wisdom. It would be a queen, a princess. She would be the most beautiful angel of God. So it's the idea that even the most valuable, smartest, intelligent, and beautiful angel can fall, but through the ashes of the phoenix, you can rise again and ascend. And it's this, it's this process in life that gives it meaning, that people can overcome your deaths and trials and tribulations. And the Gnostic journey is the to overcome this life and to overcome your, your, your shortcomings and become the best person you can change the world, feed the hunger, you know, help end the, the worship of an evil Yahweh and change the world. That's, that's the epic goal of Sophia, the goddess of wisdom is to bring enlightenment to the world, to bring knowledge and truth and light. And yeah, the only reason that they think that Lucifer was like the most beautiful angel, again, that reference to the King of Tyre later, like two chapters later, it references that he was covered in gemstones. Mm -hmm. Again, still referencing a mortal king with rings and a crown and like necklaces, not and he was his a, actual skin covered in fucking gems. And he was a musician, which I seem to remember somewhere tying that to David because David was also a, or King David was also a musician. I can't remember what that is now, but yeah, like like Lucifer was was beautiful, gorgeous, and they described as the morning star, and he was also a musician. Like that was his role uh, in heaven. Um, and then he cast, got cast down. Um, yeah, sorry. Keep going. I just had that thought. So, so what, what, what's funny is in some Gnostic tales is it's not actually Lucifer or Sophie, the goddess of wisdom that gets cast out of heaven. It's actually Yahweh. And the Bible reverses the story as Gnostics. When we read the Bible, we actually, we, ch the, the, the common tale is change everything. Everyone that you think is good in the Bible is now evil. And everyone who's evil is now good. So it wasn't Lucifer cast out of heaven. It was Yahweh. Yahweh directly, right? You're, if you're if you're Trump, what do you do? You say Hillary Clinton 
is evil and is eating children and you create a conspiracy and vice versa. Yahweh is simply running a hate campaign and trying to defame Lucifer's reputation. He's just talking shit about his enemies saying, no, Lucifer is the one that got kicked out of heaven, not me. When Lucifer comes down to help you, that's the devil. That's the Antichrist. So it's Ooh, it's no. just it's just a simple hate campaign. It's propaganda. Turn that's down so for what? Interesting. Now all of a sudden we have to get around. What the Drink. fuck? It wasn't Lucifer, was it? Is it Lucifer, Natalie? Lucifer, the word? Oh, I'm drinking the wrong thing. You said drink it again. Is it Lucifer? Sophia, was it? I'll, just, I'll no. fucking kill this. It couldn't be Sophia. You've mentioned that a lot. Yeah. Nope. Lucifer. Um, They're like 40 seconds behind us. That's probably why. Sorry. Um. So, but that's, oh, fuck. Lucifer being Yahweh. Hold on. Yahweh. So the reversal. Okay. So, so, so really quickly, like really quickly, when you read the Bible, you got to understand it's an investigative novel, right? Like this is what people don't understand. There's a great deceiver in the Bible. People wake up. The Bible literally says there's a dude roaming around the earth who's evil and jealous and angry and hateful. And he's tricking everybody into thinking he's loving. Well, huh? Does it take a genius? You're always like, I'm jealous, I'm angry, I'm hateful, but I'm righteous. Well, who's the devil? I mean, for me, it's brain dead easy to, to, to break the mythos and the fairy tale to discover who, you know, is the evil villain in the book. It really fucking is. He says that jealous is his name, Yahweh Kana, and he describes himself as full of envy and full of wrath. Like I'm a jealous God. Yep. I, I brought up Numbers 31 earlier. The book of Job itself, so like if Samael is an agent of Yahweh in particular... Uh, uh, for him to be like, you know, he's got everything. If he had nothing, he wouldn't like you. And it's like, okay, well, kill his children for me, would you please? And then make his life miserable. And then that, and, it's a gamble that he makes with the devil. Yeah. And it's fucking like I fucking hate the Book of Job. The Book of Job is what convinced me that the Bible was bullshit because I started reading it as a kid and I was like, this is fucking horrible. Like, let alone all the time. Like, even worse, I think, than Numbers, right? So, like, the justification for Numbers thirty-one is that the Metanites were evil. So it's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth type shit. That, you know, oh, well, they, they were mean to us. They enslaved us. They did these things to us. So let's kill all of them, except we're going to keep the prepubescent virgin girls for ourselves. Yeah. It's a little fucked up. Um, so that, just uh, that by itself, I don't know how anybody can read that chapter and not think that Yahweh is evil. Yeah, and in, in the Bible, it says the followers of the devil will call good evil and evil good. Yahweh calls jealousy good. He calls anger good. He calls hate good. He calls killing babies righteous. He calls killing children righteous, right? He kills, he condones slavery. He tells Moses to go pillage, plunder, and loot over 60 different cities in the Old Testament Bible, and he calls it justified. So, I mean, when in the Bible does Satan ever once say pillaging, plundering, looting, slavery, jealousy, anger, and hate is actually righteous? Well, never. So I mean, we found the devil. It's clearly Yahweh. It couldn't. It can't be anybody else. Is it, what? Are, is it Yahweh? Is it Yahweh? It's either Yahweh or evil. Drink time five. You're gonna get us fucking like sloshed. Okay, we're gonna be unable to stand by the end of it. Is it evil? Because that's that's a terrible buzzword. <laughs> Jealousy. Hate. Anger. It, it also it doesn't have to be a specific word. It can also be like a. a a subject or phrase. or a phrase like like God being oh. evil, like any reference to God being evil, could be the trigger. Um, I'm just, so we're gonna be just pissed. I'm like, <laughs> I'm the fan. Oh, evil is one of them. Natalie, out of you. Evil is one of them. The concept of evil. So hmm. instead of evil, to avoid uh, getting sloshed, we should say making bad choices. <laughs> when you, you can just you can cut that one out because I have a rolling list of stuff because depending on what you guys talk about, we might not hit any of them. So well, you have a list. You can cut evil out. So you are trying to get us tanked. All no, right. you can do that on your own. Oh so once once we figure out the word, then it gets marked from the list. Yeah. Okay. Can okay. okay. We can do that. It's cool. right. So now we can say evil freely. Okay. I don't. So that's the thing. What were we talking about? <laughs> oh Jesus! Um, Speaking of Jesus, uh, Hyper, you had mentioned uh, backstage that there are some Gnostic texts that talk about how Jesus is actually evil. Um, I've recently, I've recently started 
uh, learning about the Ascension of Isaiah, uh, which is a, I'm not sure if it's considered Gnostic or not, but it was uh, written about the same time as Mark, the earliest gospel. Uh, and it talks about Jesus being killed by the devil. Um, and it's, it's a really different, interesting take, and it sounds like it, it, it might tie into this somehow. So Jesus, why is Jesus evil? I'm yeah, anxious so, to hear. Well, in the Bible, it says we're judged by our fruit, right? A righteous tree is going to have good apples. A, poison tr a poisonous tree is going to have what? Poisonous apples. Well, when we look at Christianity, the direct actions and results of supposedly an all-knowing, all-powerful creator God, he literally started a religion that, one, almost died, two, had the Inquisitions, the Crusades, and the witch burnings, which he sat up in heaven and watched while people killed in his name, innocent people. The Old Testament Bible, if it's true, even though a lot of it's not, would be all of the death and genocide and slavery in the name of Jesus. The slave trade that the Abrahamic books you know, have justified is done in the name of Jesus. And even the modern day anti, I call it an anti-human rights campaign against the LGBTQ plus community is done in the gospel of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. It's his book. It's his religion. He started it in one Peter. Jesus says uh, on Peter, the first pope of supposedly the Catholic church, I build this rock. So supposedly Jesus is the founder of the Catholic church and Protestantism is a heresy of Catholicism. So if Jesus is supposed to be some loving guy, why did he start one of the most evil and violent religions of all time? When we go into the Bible and we read, you know, some of the stuff he said, uh, Matthew 13, 13, Jesus says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand me. So Jesus admits in Matthew 13, why is the Bible and written in such, an, in, in such an unconvincing, baffling, silly, parable manner? Because he's here to confuse and divide. Jesus wants 40,000 different Christian denominations. He wants confusion. He wants war. He wants people to fight over who he is. This is what he came to do. In Luke 19, 27, Jesus says, but those enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Now, Christians are always going to argue context, 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 yet they will post Bible verses of, hey, Jesus loves you. Okay, well, where's the context to that Bible verse, right? So we have a lot of these Bible verses where Jesus, and there's more if we want to get deeper into it, where Jesus may have not been the benevolent character he was. In Luke, Jesus, sorry, in Matthew 2, 1, 12, Jesus tells people to sell their possessions and buy swords. Why? Because he's leading a rebellion against the Roman Empire. When we study Roman law, Anyone who led a rebellion against the Roman Empire merited execution immediately because it was high treason to be a Jewish prophet and to be trying to overthrow the Roman Empire. So did Jesus tell people, sell your possessions and follow the Lord or sell your possessions and buy weapons? Because we're going to when I rise from the dead, I'm going to lead I'm going to lead you on a revolution to overthrow the Roman Empire. So Ooh, when we read the Bible, we start to see a different narrative being formed. Yeah, that's um, we had Tech Freak in the comments talking about Jesus cursing the fig tree. That one never really sat right with me. Stealing the pig farmer's pigs, committing sedition in front of the Romans. So he just brought up Richard Carrier talks about a lot about that verse. Um, um, because in, in that verse, it's it's uh, in that verse it talks about the the fig tree is out of season to bear fruit, uh, but Jesus curses it anyway. So then he yeah. he you know comes the next day and is like, oh, it didn't bear fruit. Well, then it's you know, it's cursed, even though it's he, he admits in the text itself that it's out of season. There's no way it would in the first place. Um, I'm just started reading a book called The uh, Power of Parables, um, which I think I left outside because I brought it in. Oh, you brought it in. Where is it? Do you want it? Yeah. Um, yes, it, 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 it breaks down like all the like different parables in, in the, the uh, Bible, especially in the Gospels um, that they pull from. Uh, and then, like, like how uh, the story of Samson ties into Hercules, and um, there it is, uh, the power of parable by uh, John Dominic Crosnan. Cross oh, Crosnan. Right, um, so I'm only like that that far into it, but uh, but it's so pretty interesting. I mean, that ties to a lot. Like most of what Jesus says is, are supposed to be treated as parables. Uh, um, that one I don't understand. I don't. I don't understand cursing a fig tree out of season. So, ha have you guys ever read like Mystic Christianity? So, th there's the verse where Jesus says he walks on water. And if th there's a guy called P. D. Ospensky who was one of the highest scholars of Mystic Christianity, and when Jesus said he walked on water, 
the, the, the actual interpretation of that Bible verse was in the Bible, it explains the waters of heaven. Well, Jesus is not walking on waters. He's, he's walking on the waters of heaven. So it's a parable. When Jesus heals the blind, he's spirit, someone is spiritually blind, and now you can spiritually see. When Jesus raises a person from the dead, they're spiritually dead, now they're spiritually alive. So in, in Gnosticism or, or mystic Christianity, there was no supernatural claims. These are parables about becoming enlightened through the knowledge and secret teachings of Jesus Christ, which were all about the truth of life. So there were no actual miracles. He was talking about other things. See, now that's, that's a nice way to think about it, but the intent of those was the same intent as like the plagues of Egypt. So in the Old Testament, the plagues of Egypt are Yahweh uh, um, sort of slighting the, the gods of Egypt. It's like every plague was a slight on a specific god of Egypt. And Jesus walking on water and calming the storms was specifically Jesus overcoming Poseidon. And then Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead was Jesus overcoming Hades. Uh, uh, so all, a lot of the miracles had something to do uh, along the lines of like mocking or sort of intentionally uh, um, stepping over a different God. Um, and that's a common theme throughout the Bible in general. So like we talked earlier about things in the Bible turning out to be like uh, um, sort of a, a reversal. And one of the big ones I bring up all the time is uh, uh, Beelzebul. Baal's, Beelzebub is Beelzebul. That is the Lord of Princes who is sort of taken by Judaism to mean the Lord of Flies as an mm -hmm. insult to the city-state of Ekron, who was their national god. Who is laughing? What's going on? Are y'all being funny in the comments? We're, we're having fun in the comments. Don't just ignore us. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll mute my comments. I, I can't because, my... because Rachel can't <laughs> stop laughing. So I, that's, that just kind of cracked me up. Um, Maybe I'll just mute, so, mute my mic when I'm not talking. <laughs> no, I can see the intent there for it being like, well, it's parable. And it's like, yeah, uh, I don't think I'm, it was meant I'm to be taken literally, but I also see it yeah. as uh, um, slights on the Greek gods, mm -hmm. which, yeah. you know, that's that's the whole point of like Christianity tying into then the Roman Empire switching from Hellenism to Christianity uh, uh, was Jesus kind of like dunking on all their gods. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. They, they had to kill paganism, kill polytheism. They had to build a monotheistic religion. If you're the Roman Empire and you're competing with all these poly polytheistic religions, what do you do? Well, you invent hell, you invent original sin, and you create the one creator God who came down and died for your sins, and now you need him. Otherwise, your religion is obsolete. Oh, you're a pagan and you worship another God? Doesn't matter because you're going to be burned and killed. So it was basically a marketing tactic, right? These guys were psychological geniuses. They were – they just – they were they – were, the Amazon of religion, they just had to take over. And so what they did was they invented a monotheistic God who became the Amazon, the Jeff Bezos of religion. And then now everyone is under one banner and they got I, their, yeah. yeah. I yeah. bring that up about Judaism that uh, uh, I feel like the Israelites did that intentionally because they saw that having the 70 nations, having the 70 different sons of, of uh, Elyon divided them. And that they were trying to unite, which is, you know, that you can consider that a noble pursuit, trying to unite all of canon under Yahweh. And so then the Romans, I think that Constantine saw that. I think he saw, okay, well, these different Greek city-states, Sparta and Athens and Thebes, are all fighting each other because they think their god is the best god. Well, what if we had one god? Mm -hmm. But it didn't work anyway. Split, you know, divisions abound one way or the other, 40,000 different Christian sects. So you mentioned um, <laughs> I, that Rachel figured out how to post as you. <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's some some fun stuff happening in the comments. Um, so you mentioned um, the Trinity earlier, hyper. And that's that's the doctrine of the Trinity is is part of the way they they spread the monotheistic idea uh, among the pagans who are polytheistic, and they were like, oh, we we also believe in multiple gods, um, and then they they introduced the idea of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and then from there it came a whole bunch of debates about the the nature of the divinity of the Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and they were like literally, si sorry, fucking common section. Um, <laughs> so yeah, like like polytheism like blended in to monotheism via the Trinity. Like the Trinity was like like the uh, the avenue uh, that the two kind of came together. Um, and this this was the nature of how religion spread. And we, we've talked a lot about tonight how the um, you know the concept of Lucifer and and Satan and all these like and the canine mythology or canine polytheism. Sorry, shit. 
Canaanite uh, polytheism, like they all kind of meshed together and they changed as history moved on because that was the nature of how fuck drink again. All right. Polytheism. It was polytheism. Don't even bullshit me. Well, turn down for no, Is it Canaanite? I've just noticed it says it on the bottom of the screen. Yeah. I've just noticed that. She does it so that I know to hit the button to make the music. Okay. Play. So that that's how that's how religion spreads. Like you, you go to a, a neighboring country or, or village and you say, We believe in these gods. Uh and if you're the invading religion, you say, We need you to believe in this, you know, this set of beliefs. And they say no. So you think, okay, we need to compromise then. You say, let's blend our beliefs together. And that's basically how it happens. Uh, and it's very similar to when I when I talk about Islam. Uh, it's the exact same thing that Muhammad did. Like Muhammad uh, couldn't convert people in his homeland of Mecca. So he moved to a neighboring country, which was dominated by Jews. So he went there with his, um, his message and he incorporated elements of Judaism from the Old Testament into it in order to appeal to them. So he was more successful. He was so successful that he was able to raise an army and conquer his own homeland. Yeah. He uh, also took so. a Gnostic. He took a Gnostic principle of Jesus not having a physical body and never dying on the cross. That he Muhammad took that Did from he? Christian Gnosticism. Yes, that was in the Gnostic Gospels. The some of the Gnostics believe Jesus could never have died. He never had a physical body and he was never crucified. So Muhammad and the, and the Muslims, they they have the same philosophy. They think Jesus never died. There was a different person who was killed. Jesus never died. He can't. He was an angel. So they, they took that from Christianity too. You know, that's interesting because that could relate to uh, um, the two Jesuses, essentially, because Jesus, so Barabbas's name in some of the older manuscripts was yeah. Yeshua Barabba. And Jesus's name was given yep. as Jesus, you know, Yeshua Barabba, because that is oh, son of son his father. father. It was a common name for like yeah. bastards and orphans. And it's like, well, he's not Bar Yosef, but he's not, you know, he's not fucking the son of God either. So they call them Barabba in those fucking manuscripts. I'm using the F word too much. I'm a little tipsy. Sorry. Uh, um, so if the concept then is like, do you want, you know, yeah. Jesus, you know, Yeshua Barabba, or do you want Yeshua Barabba? Who is called Christ? That maybe very confusing. Barabbas, which is, is the never, one who died on the cross, not Jesus. Yeah, which which is which is was not a thing. Like that whole like uh, once a well, yeah. year, uh, pilot uh, excuse or a uh, uh, freeze a prisoner. Like that would have never happened in ancient Rome, especially by Pontius Pilate. Uh, they go and say that hey, uh, we want this guy to be executed instead of this known murderer and traitor uh, to the Roman Empire. Like he would never let that guy just go free. Uh, but what it does is it em it emulates the uh, the Passover where you have two goats. One is chosen, and that it's it's the scapegoat. It's where the term scapegoat came from. That goat is sacrificed. All the sins are yeah. put on that goat. He's sacrificed, and there was good. Like that's that's where that whole thing came from. But the idea that there was this yearly tradition where Pontius Pilate or the Roman Emperor or whoever uh, excuses whoever the crowd wants, that, that was never a thing. That's not mentioned anywhere in, in historical records. So, yeah, which shady shit. We, I mean, we get into <laughs> that constantly, too, that uh, um, the Gospels are anonymous, uh, uh, were written anonymously. Additionally, they contradict one another. Um, Jesus has contradicting genealogies. Both are attributed to Joseph, who isn't Jesus's real father. So why does it matter that Joseph is the son of David? It doesn't. Uh, uh, and then, oh, well, Luke is actually Mary's genealogy. No, it's not. No, because yeah. No, fuck, it's not. Fucking uh, we, we, um, we gospel can lead this of James. The, we can mm -hmm. lead this into the, uh, the, the Melchizedek conversation. Of who he is. Yeah, like, is this, let's do it. This is all about this is all about the lines and where you come from. This was a massive debate of who Jesus was. Was he the Messiah or not? So what happened was when Jesus came on scene, there was there was the Jews called into question where he came from. Right? They didn't think he really came from the line of Aaron, from Moses and Abraham. Right? Yet when Jesus was crucified. According to the Bible, Pontius Pilate put on the cross, here, here dies the king of the Jews. Jesus said he was a Jew. So he was claiming he was of the, the line of Aaron. He never claimed he was the line of Melchizedek. Jesus never spoke that name, never said that word, never claimed it. Yet like the Bible invented the Trinity later on, the Christians, because the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, they had to come up with something because he wasn't the Messiah. And so the Christians... 
writing the Bible appealed to the secret order of Melchizedek because the Melchizedek order was the order of Melchizedek who worshiped El Elyon and his order was the heavenly order of eternal angels who could not die, who weren't earthly. The earthly order of Aaron was the was the, the Jewish order, the Israelite order of them. And Jesus was rejected by them as not having a lineage. So he couldn't appeal to them. He couldn't be the Messiah of the Jews. So the Christians appeal to the Melchizedek order instead. Otherwise, Jesus would have been erased and the religion would have never have happened if that order did not exist. Uh, immediately following that chapter, Yahweh is called Elyon Yahweh. Um, and I see that as just a deception. I see that as Yahweh claiming to be Elyon, though he isn't. Um, what it actually is is, is uh, uh, remnants of you know, the polytheism uh, of the original Judaism where they were trying to rewrite, as we said earlier, rewriting polytheistic stories into a monotheistic religion, and they just kind of fucked up. They didn't do it as well as they should have. If they had taken every, uh, every instance of Elohim, Adonai, uh, um, Elyon, and just changed that to Yahweh at some point while they were doing these manuscripts, yeah. we wouldn't even be talking about this today. We wouldn't know. Uh, but they didn't do that. They just kind of like poorly rewrote these polytheistic uh, um, stories to I, attribute I them to Yahweh. They didn't understand them. They didn't they understand weren't. the Canaanite pantheon. That's what, that's what I believe. I believe the Bible writers didn't really understand themselves what these words meant, right? They didn't have the complete knowledge of the Canaanite pantheon. And so they might have actually thought later on in like the 15th century, they might have thought El was a generic word for God. They might have truly believed that, but it, it's not the case. You know? Well, hell, Hebrew itself is the last extant Canaanite language. Uh, um, so it, it's, that's, it's just, it's true. People don't want to acknowledge that. They don't want to acknowledge that the word Elohim isn't a Hebrew word in the same way that like pepperoni isn't an English word. And in America, you order a pepperoni pizza, you get a pizza with salami on it. You order a pepperoni pizza in Italy, you get a pizza that's got green or red peppers on it. That, that you know, the translations and the translations of the translations <laughs> and the editing you lose so much context that it's like you just go back and you look and it's so easy to see. And we do, we, we bang our heads on the wall about this on a weekly basis on TikTok. And there are people that just don't care about the origins because they don't read the book anyway. Mm -hmm. And they just want to just yell at you for no reason. It's like if you took 30 seconds to look into this and kind of well, set your confirmation bias aside yeah. for two seconds, you'd understand, but you don't. So I'm, I'm trying to push the Melchizedek thing massive on my TikTok because Melchizedek was a Gentile. He was a Canaanite. Yet Abraham, clearly a Jew, subordinated not only the entire Old Testament, but Yahweh himself to El Elyon and Melchizedek. This means the whole modern day Christian religion that worships Yahweh, the whole religion, everybody, all 2.4 billion Christians are all subordinate to El Elyon in the secret order of Melchizedek because he worshiped El Elyon and not Yahweh. He was a Gentile and a Canaanite and not a Jew. And Abraham gave tilth to him, which is something you only do to God. So he was subordinating himself, becoming subservient to Melchizedek, who was the secret order of the heavenly God of El Elyon. So in Jesus Christ himself, the Bible writers tried to appeal to Melchizedek with Jesus, yet Jesus never once said he was Melchizedek, never once appealed to it himself. He, in fact, called Yahweh his father, said he was a Jew, and he was the Jewish king and the Jewish Messiah. This leads into Jesus actually being a prophet of Yahweh and not a prophet of El Elyon, the most supreme and high God of the Canaanite pantheon. It, you know, it's... It's a little infuriating me because that just, you know, they, they try to correlate Jesus with Melchizedek as like it was written that Melchizedek never aged. He was immortal. Yeah, he's supposed he to be immortal. a type or typology of Jesus, just like Moses or David. Well, There's no well, difference between that the, and them the referring Bible. to the Elohim as the Trinity. It's just them trying to rewrite Jewish dogma to fit Christianity to make Christianity yep. make sense. In it. Yeah. It's a conspiracy, man. <laughs> what, 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 what's interesting Whoops. though is, is the bible refutes itself because if you read hebrews 7 3 it says melchizedek had no mother or father 
well, Jesus Christ was the son of God and had a father. So if Melchizedek has no mother or father, Melchizedek is the father of Jesus. He is God in the Old Testament himself, if we're taking this literally. So Melchizedek is God. He's Yahweh. Or, 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 or. That's um, potentially possible. So here's the weird thing there. Is it though. Melchizedek? No. No? Right. Zedek is a god in uh, uh, Polynesian mythology. So Melchizedek is actually a theophoric name that honors a god that isn't yep. Elyon or Yahweh. Um, and there's a bunch of those. There's, there's uh, a, a couple that honor Zeus. Um, we were talking earlier, in fact, that uh, uh, about that sort of religious syncretism where, you know, uh, um, the, the conquering nation wants to, like, bring whoever into the fold. And so to do that, they sort of culturally appropriate or through religious syncretism or adoption or whatever you want to call it, they adopt those gods into their own fold. The Romans tried to do that with the Jews and considered... Yahweh to be an aspect of Zeus or Jupiter, and uh, um, they weren't having that. Uh, yeah. you, I want to say you mentioned that in an earlier video, Ricky, where you were like, that was the biggest heresy that they could, like, the imaginable for them. That uh, uh, who's slurring your words? Am I swaying? No, we're, we're waiting on you to start slurring your words. <laughs> um, somebody says that your room is beautiful, Hyper. I have to agree. I like the color scheme agree. you got going there. Yeah, I think red and gold is always it. a good choice. Are those are those pots and pans you have hanging like in where b behind you on your over your right shoulder? What is that uh, like there? Your left left oh, shoulder, other, other side. Okay, there. Oh, yeah, in the window. Are, what is that no, hanging? Those are, those are two plants, and then that's a that's an industrial light. Oh, it looked like a pan to me. Yeah, it's, it's one like, of those big. Yeah, it's, it's one of those big lamps that that are huge. Hmm. But. Hmm. Uh, what was I, I dropped my say? last piece of sorry. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, yeah, in, in one of the lost gospels, Melchizedek is described as the highest angel in the council of El. Um, not Elohim, but of El. So in the Gnostic Gospel, it says Melchizedek stands in the council of El, is what it says. So the Gnostics believe that Melchizedek, not Jesus, might have been the true Messiah, right? Jesus would therefore become the Antichrist and the prophet of Yahweh. Ooh. Hmm. So then does that mean Melchizedek would be higher in rank than Michael? It, um, so I think it's Jehovah Witnesses. Do they I think they equivalent Melchizedek with Michael the Archangel? I'm not sure. Do I they? Think they do. Somebody mentioned that I it is the Jehovah's Witnesses. Somebody said that in my thing where they're like Melchizedek is Michael, and I was like, first of all, no. It's um, Jehovah's Witness, yeah. Secondly, the archangels aren't actually the highest choir of angel. Um, yeah. They are third or fourth tier. The highest choir are uh, the seraphim who are the attendants of Elion. Mm -hmm. um, so they are like around the throne of Elion or the throne of Baal in the Baal cycle. Because the uh, right. angels are carryovers from Zoroastrianism. They don't actually belong to canonite polytheism or uh, uh judaism they were stolen essentially it's all, um, all fucking blended together yeah so okay stolen might not be the best word to use in that case because you know it's not like they yeah, necessarily it's not so much it. stolen, stolen. It's, it's it's incorporated or compromised y'all don't like, get like, me like, get me drunk down for one. get me drunk <laughs> off the is drunk the word stolen compromised stolen? it can't be Angels? Stole, stole, it can't be stole. angels. No. Uh, oh, she she does it delayed, so we can't guess. So we got appropriation. I'm running out of vinegar. Hmm. I don't know. But what's what's funny about the, the 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 Melchizedek is we don't have any information on him. He the the one Dead Sea Scrolls or the the Gnostic Gospel from Nagamani libraries. We have one page. The rest was destroyed. So there was a massive conspiracy in the Catholic Church to make sure anything on Melchizedek that should have been in the Bible was eradicated. Well, why? Well, because they were pushing a narrative and he didn't fit to the narrative. Maybe because Jesus was not in that line. You know, that's that's how I would conclude it. Ricky did that debate with the toddler. What was his name? Bram. Um, Bram. And oh, God, he pissed me off. I feel like it was that debate where he asked you, he's like, you know, if Jesus died and was 
and was not resurrected. But like, are you suggesting that his followers went and robbed his grave and made it look like he had because that would be heresy? Like, do you think that they did that to fulfill some kind of agenda? And the answer to that question should have been, well, I don't believe that it happened. So this hypothetical is irrelevant, but I, I would uh, say hundred. Um, so I would say hundred percent Jesus was going to fake his resurrection because if we read the Bible in John before Jesus was right before he was killed, it said that all of the people were, they filled Rome and they were waiting for Jesus to be resurrected from the cross. So Jesus, so, he, so I'm setting the scene. Okay. Jesus gets arrested. He he's walking down and everyone's watching him. It's a, it's a, fucking major event god of the universe is being killed and it's going to rise from the dead everyone from this everywhere from nearby villages are flooding into rome i mean rome is over flooded nobody can control rome jesus gets put on the cross he's killed in three hours it takes the average person to die on the cross 48 to 72 hours jesus dies in three hours according to the bible when joseph in the bible it says this in the bible when he goes to punctures Pilate to ask for jesus's body punctures Pilate in the bible goes really he just died now. Like Pontius Pilate was skeptical. And so what happens is they have a soldier spear Jesus in the side to confirm that he was dead. So the conspiracy was Jesus was trying to convince people that he was going to fake his resurrection, rise from the dead, pretend he was God and lead a revolution against the Roman Empire because he filled the city with people. Yet he died and got killed and no one ever saw him again and the religion died and that was it. More importantly, like, the, uh, you know, if you were positing that it was true, that that uh, um, the the account of the Gospels was true, yes, I absolutely believe that a group of religious fanatics would fake the resurrection of their Messiah through a, a, a sort of um, shared delusion that that's the, that was the right thing to do in whatever case. Well, they were, gonna be, they were going to start a new religion. Today? They were going to be messiahs and gods. They had everything to gain from faking the resurrection. They were going to be the, the disciples of the, the creator of the universe who rose from the dead. They were going to be masters of Cloud. the universe, praise themselves, Cloud. popes and priests who became wealthy kings and kings of the universe. They, Of course they would fake his resurrection. They had everything to gain. Who cares if they die? They might become rulers of the of the earth. So of course they were going to fake it. Of course they were going to, and only one of the gospels is their guards outside the, outside the tomb. The other three gospels, they don't even mention guards because they omit it. They just, they don't even say, but in only one is their guards. So we might conclude the one gospel that says there's guards outside the tomb might be fabricated. That detail might be added. Matthew says, you know, we need to put guards outside the tomb so the disciples don't steal the body and fake his resurrection. The first deception will be better than the last. So the Gospels are saying that Jesus already deceived people once and his second deception will be better than the last. Like they're, they're giving you the answers in the Bible. And oh, the that whole, happens the so often. Jesus being buried in a tomb was I, – I, I made a video of this earlier. Um, uh, came from Genesis 15 where Joseph – uh, begged the king uh, for the body of his father so that he could bury it in a tomb that he made for himself. Uh, in the Gospels, Joseph of Arimathea begs Pontius Pilate for the body of Jesus so he could bury it in a tomb uh, that he, he bought for himself. Like, they didn't even change the names, Joseph in both of those narratives. Uh, Paul doesn't seem to have a problem with the idea of Jesus being buried in a mass grave. Um, shit, I'm blanking out. Where was I going with this? So there was a guy um, who wrote a book on Jesus faking his resurrection, and he argued that the reason why Joseph wanted to get the body off the cross and bury it personally was because they wanted to try to save Jesus from being from dying because he got speared in the side. And so yeah, that's the it, reason why they, that's why they wanted to get him off because they wanted to make sure he didn't die. So they were they were he was in Punctious Pilate's office three hours after the resurrection. Like we need to get him off the cross now. Like, so he doesn't actually die because the whole plan is going to be fucked if he dies. So they were literally trying to get him off the cross to try to revive him. And then he died. And then it, the whole thing fell from there. And that's, that, that's one thing I mentioned, like either he, he, he wasn't actually dead or the di disciples did take his body or seal's body, uh, which was common in that area. There were laws against that uh, because it was such a problem. Um, the Syriacs believe that Jesus had a twin brother uh, and that, yeah. Uh, you know, they saw Jesus' twin after his resurrection. Um, 
And that's why they didn't. The, isn't there gospels where people don't recognize Jesus? Like they don't. Yeah. Think, yeah. Like, in, the gospels in, the, in the New Testament, they don't recognize him because he's. Yeah. The explanation, explanation that is he's assumed a new body. Um, so to say all of those things are, are crazy talk doesn't make sense. Uh, so thus, uh, the the resurrection is the, the best explanation. Like that that is by definition an argument from incredulity. It, it makes more sense to me that they put a stunt double in because Jesus died in three hours when most guys die in seventy two hours. That's crazy, oh, this? right? That's crazy. And then all of a sudden, no one recognizes Jesus. So I see that as Jesus had brothers. So maybe one of his brothers stepped in, tried to pretend he was Jesus. No one recognized him. And then that was it. They just, they just, they're like, this is not going to work. Nobody is going to believe this. And then that was it, you know, and they just stole the body. They were, I mean, put yourself in Pontius Pilate's shoes. You have a crazy Messiah who claims that he's God of the universe and you killed him. Are you going to put guards outside his grave? No, you just saw the guy get killed. You don't care. You don't think this guy is God. You're going to move yeah. on and you got, your, you got your city, you got your state to run. You don't care about this lunatic. Like no one is thinking about Jesus, the crazy lunatic. He wasn't even written down in history. That means he was so insignificant. Punctious Pod didn't give a fuck who this guy was. He thought he was a crazy drunk who called himself God, not even important enough to even mention him in history. So in that case, no, there weren't guards outside the tomb because nobody cared. Jesus died. They knew he was dead. He's six feet under the ground and game over. Check me. And everyone moved on with their life. That, like I mentioned, there's, uh, that, uh, there's no... um. Like I said, the uh, robbing graves was very common in that area or in that that time, um, which is why there were laws uh, written against it. Uh, when it comes to the Gospels and, and the book of Acts, uh, there's no mention of the trials uh, because whenever a body went missing, there was an investigation just like there, there would be today. Uh, the Roman officials would investigate what happened to this body, where did it go? Um, and then whoever was suspected would be tried before the courts. And there would be records of those. Uh, there's no records in, in, in the Gospels. And even the Gospels themselves, um, there, there's records of, or they mention records of um, like Paul's trials and some of the uh, disciples' trials. Uh, but there's no mention of the trials because of Jesus' disappearing body. Um, yep, yep. So it's, it's, it's all evidence. Right this, this would, if this actually happened... We would have all these records that they might even be mentioned in the Gospels themselves, but there's there was nothing. One, there was one historian, I forget his name, who wrote that he thinks we only have three weeks of Jesus's life actually historically documented in the Bible, meaning from Jesus's stories, it might only be it could be possibly condensed to three weeks of everything he did. You know, like we don't have his childhood. We don't have like your God who can turn water into wine and walk on water. Where are you when you're 20? Why aren't you saving the universe and flying around like Superman at age 22? Like, what are you doing? Like, you're God. Like Where are you? Age 14? Like, why aren't would, you a baby uh, performing miracles? Like, it's absurd to think Jesus was God. And then all of a sudden at 30, he just, oh, here we go. T time to, you know, like it doesn't, none of it makes sense. Thomas goes into that. The Gospel of Thomas discusses his life from 13 to 30. That's the one where he kills a child. Um, that happens. happens. Yep. The the common like understanding around that, uh, um, and I'm trying to remember, other than the Gospel of Thomas, it's mentioned in a couple other extra biblical accounts, is that he essentially was like he had to learn. He had to learn how to be a good person, uh, and and like studied in the east that's the whole concept of like where people think that he went to japan or china uh and learned from like buddhists or even learned from the buddha um which is hilarious to me because we're told he jesus is perfect he never sinned so you're telling me he's got to learn like this guy should have exactly been exactly why they cut perfect. it out of the bible he should have been they an eight-year-old changing the world like why they, wait till age 30 like come on they dude. couldn't depict him as being human at all he had yeah. to be God, and so they cut out everything that depicted him as human, everything that depicted him as having any sort of sin. To include, because uh, you mentioned James, that's uh, um, that's deuter deuterocanonical. That's uh, um, uh, the Gospel of James. I think he's mentioned in one of the Pauline epistles, though, isn't he? The book of James. James, the, James, the brother, sorry, James, the brother of Christ. Isn't he? he I feel like he's mentioned in... Up next to Park Karaoke, <laughs> they're they're doing a, a really funny thing in the comments right now. I love it. But uh, I don't do karaoke. Sorry, so, I'm sorry. 
You don't do karaoke? Yeah, I love karaoke. I just get angry TikTok where people get mad at me for yelling and talking too loud. Oh, I love your vernacular, man. I love <laughs> I love the style of I your do TikToks. Too. Uh, and a lot I, I of people you talk for fucking ages, bro. Um, there's an anime where Jesus and Buddha are roommates. You're either making that up or that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. I'm, I'm going to need to know to I need more, need more information about that. Yeah, 100. What is this anime? Ooh. How'd you figure out how to do that, Rachel? You got somebody's comments up on the thing. I love that. It's not me. I didn't do it. Oh, was that Nat? You didn't do it's it? How'd that pop up? Nat doesn't have any commissions. Who's, who's fucking? I don't know. What? Does that mean we um we reached a thousand followers? Does that mean we reached a thousand? I don't know. Because that that, that's the thing. It's, you can do super chats after you reach a thousand. Yeah, Jim said at the beginning of this, Meaning Forge says we got over a thousand now. So what? Hell yeah! I love nice. it. Yeah. Yes. Boom. What's up, you beautiful buttholes? <laughs> Sorry, uh, there's I a love dude it. on TikTok who starts that, and I, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but I love him every time. I don't either, but I, I, I like him too. I want to um, make a knife for him. I'm trying to remember if. James is mentioned in the actual Bible itself, and I don't remember. But there's yeah, and, and, I think in Acts, he's is he beheaded in Acts? There's to... so many people that don't think that Jesus had brothers and sisters, though, and it's like they want to uh, maintain the virginity of the mother Mary after Jesus's birth, and it's like yeah. um, she was married to a man in the Middle East two thousand years. They had more kids. They had several yeah. more kids. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Thinking otherwise is is. I mean, it was beneficial to have more kids, on, unlike it is today. Yeah. Because uh, um, three of them would die before they fucking hit. That's sad. I'm, I just made myself sad. Yeah, it's like 40% <laughs> uh, infantile. Which is why people think that people only lived to be like 30, 35 years back then, is that the infant mortality rate brought down the average lifespan. Mm -hmm. But if you survived infancy, you could live to be 70, 75 years old wasn't it wasn't uncommon at all um so it, um is is there anything else we want to talk about or is this a good transition in, uh point into our nerdy conversation because i think that that could tie into what we're talking about pretty smoothly what do y'all think well, if you could tie it in smoothly. what's up i might have one other verse um yeah, I, I did have one other verse i wanted to share before you know that it was john 8 37 through 47 uh, when uh, Jesus is talking to the Jews, right? And the Jews say, we are not illegitimate children. They protested to Jesus. The only father we have is God himself. And Jesus says to the Jews, if God were your father, then you would love me for I have come from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Right? And then, and then it goes on to say, um, you belong to the father, the devil. You carry your own father's desires. So there's a contradiction in the Bible where Jesus actually is, accusing the Jews of worshiping the devil and the Jews actually accuse Jesus of being the false Messiah. And it's just, this is crazy ditrimony in the Bible of, of paradoxes. It's, it's never talked about that's going down where there's actually an accusation of these guys are worshiping Yahweh, who's the devil. And now, no, these guys are saying Jesus is a deceiver. So it, it's interesting to see that go down in the Bible, the different paradigms. And yeah, that was all I got on that. Awkward silence. No, it's fine. I mean, you know, we talk about how incomprehensible the fucking Bible is. I made a video it's a while ago that I thought was really funny that was uh, um, just a bunch of gibberish. And then on the top, I was like, Yahweh trying to write a, a book that's going to make sense translated into English in 2000 years. I, I saw that, too. I, I made a video recently where I pretended to be Jesus uh, going and praying uh, in the Garden of Yosemite where he sweats blood. Uh, and I was like, yeah, I, I, I totally prayed so hard that I sweat blood and the disciples like, oh, okay. And he's like, yeah, write that down. Um, not right now, uh, 40 years from now and write it in a different language. So <laughs> and he's like, yeah. like, but you can read and write multiple languages. Why don't you write it down? And then Jesus is like, I don't want to make it too obvious for future generations. I want it yeah. to be super confusing. So yeah. 
<laughs> you're the, the Bible verse you're referring to is in the Gnostic gospel of Thomas, I think, or not Thomas, which one I forget which one, but it might have been the secret gospel of John. Jesus is bleeding blood because he just got in a fight with the Roman soldiers and he got cut by a sword. What? And so he's bleeding, he's bleeding blood, right? There's another there's another verse in the Bible where Jesus falls back mysteriously. I forget which verse it is in John where he's he just mysteriously falls back. And people say this is like a verse of a miracle. Well, no, because there's the Gnostic Gospels say there's a there's edited done there where Jesus got in a fight with the Roman soldiers and he he mysteriously fell down because he was in a fight and then he was bleeding blood because he got cut by a sword. And the Bible took these verses out because they didn't want you to know that Jesus was fighting the Roman soldiers himself. Which oh, is okay. that, I've never heard of that. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. If it bleeds, we can kill it. <laughs> I love that. The um, things you learn. I wonder, does that tie into um, Peter having his ear cut off by the Roman centurion uh, at all? Yeah, I, I think it would. I think those Bible yeah. verses were edited because they were having conflicts with the Roman Empire because they were trying to actually not have Jesus killed. They were trying to overthrow the empire. And so they were fighting and they were they were verses being edited out and they weren't edited very well as we know the through the translation. So there were parts in the Bible where you can see clear mistakes. Like Jesus doesn't bleed blood when he's praying. He got cut by a sword because he got in a fight with the Roman soldiers. Mm. Which, you know, takes out him bleeding miraculously and miracle through a miracle of praying, which wouldn't make sense. It's a, it's an explanation of he actually got in a, a combat fight with soldiers. That's so interesting. I super want to read more about that. <sighs> Do. Right, where are we at? Me. Okay, cool. cool Discord. Cool. <laughs> that was a Discord noise. I don't know. Gnosticism in general fascinates me. I don't know that I agree with the concept that the physical world is what would be evil and then like the divine singularity would be like the goodness. Um, there's so much about like nature outside of humanity that's like worth reverence i would say nature itself is pretty violent don't get me wrong but just I don't so know. so ancient gnostics believe the world was evil because if, if you for a second just pretend that you have theory of mind and you enter yourself into let's say the 10th century and or the 12th century and you're a gnostic and the catholic church shows up at your village and they rape your daughters burn your village to the ground and kill everybody and then you see witch beings burned pagans being killed you see some god of love killing everybody you don't have doctors you have toothaches people are dying of plagues I mean, where do you think you are? You might think you're in hell. You might think that the God of the Bible is literally the devil. So the ancient Gnostics lived in a time when things were very messed up. So they came to the conclusion that there was an evil creator God. Yet modern day Gnosticism wouldn't quite share the same view that there was actually an evil creator God that made the universe. We might say Yahweh is, you know, you might explain Yahweh as the shadow self of the eternal mind, right? He's not actually... You know, he's not actually evil, right? In the sense of an actually evil sky god running around on a, you know, fires of chariots, running around the, the cosmos, who actually created the universe. Just the concept of Yahweh himself as being evil. The concept of Yahweh himself is being evil as a way to explain how they how those humans interpreted their generation based on the first century that they lived in. The universe was evil, people were evil, they were being killed, there was diseases. Things people were, I mean, things were a bad, I think things were just bad back then. So, I mean, of course, you might come to the conclusion that you live in hell. Now that almost ties into Christian dogma as hell being the separation from the creator. So, if that's true, then being on earth and being separated from heaven or the divine oneness or whatever you want to call it, then earth itself would be the hell. But God, it could be a fucking paradise if we would just do the work and take care of each other. And, and that's how we see planet. it in modern day is the world is hell is heaven or hell potential. If we stop worshiping the Abrahamic God and waiting for judgment day, we can transform this place into heaven. And we can all live great lives and do great things and have purposes and meaning. Not where we all place meaning on some Christians go, what would life be without God? Well, it 
it would become meaningful because your meaning is all placed on a, an immaterial eternal heaven with no verification with a judgment day that's never going to happen. We know the lake of fire isn't real. So your meaning of life that you're putting onto the universe is fake. It's false meaning. It's illusionary. It's not real. So you guys, your meaning that you're claiming you need is not meaning at all. It's illusionary. It's fake. Let's actually live our lives meaningful right now, right here and today. And let's build paradise on earth. So that's more of the modern day view. Well, shit, if Christians would take five seconds to Google, to research, to learn about hell, they would know that even in their own dogma, it's not an actual place. So I just, that shit pisses me off, too. It's completely made up. Well, I mean, even, the concept of Gehenna being like a place where human sacrifices were had, but then Sheol itself is just the grave. And then Tartarus is only referenced once, and it's not even really, to an extent, Christian dogma. It's Greek dogma. So Hades being Sheol, the Bible only ever discusses the grave itself and then the second death. There is no eternal torment. There's no it's demons with pitchforks poking you. There's no dungeon of hell. It doesn't exist even in your own fucking Dante's book. Inferno. But they don't read. I love Dante's Inferno. It's beautiful. The game was amazing. Um, deserves a sequel. Dante's Purgatorio. I don't yeah, remember they the names of the because there, was, there wasn't enough interest in it. To be fair, uh, can we talk about that for a second? Uh, sure. The Purgatorio and Paradiso are not as interesting. They're not going to, yeah, the they're not going to, you know, be on the same level as the Inferno. Yeah. For those who don't what know, uh, topic for the <laughs> what's up? Superheroes. And uh, my hair is really good today and i feel like it's the opposite of your swoop because mine's going whoops down and yours goes up and i just thought that we were really funny having, having a nice good hair day is that what we're saying i never said you weren't i just said that's, that's I fine like how that's cool that's cool the damage is done the damage is done it's fine <laughs> i'm not that drunk i'm just i get giddy uh, um yeah so uh Superheroes, and okay. are we ready to make that transition? Fuck yes, let's do it. I love nerding yeah. out. We I, can I, tie I like in what? superheroes. I like this superhero class because I took a class in college on superheroes that were that was like that we talked about earlier. It was superheroes is like kind of like what? a religious reflection of what humans believe, right? So I'll open it up with Batman, right? Most humans in predatory capitalism, they they love billionaires. So the modern day superhero is Batman or Tony Stark. Elon Musk even runs a, a marketing campaign where he compares himself to Tony Stark. And so the human reflection of the psyche is that our saviors or messiahs like Jesus Christ are the rich people. In the olden days, it was Superman because Superman was equivalent to El, El Leon of the Bible. He was an alien. So, you know, our superheroes in a way can be a reflection of what the humans think of the generations. You know they and rewrote Tony Stark's Stark. character huh? was uh, based off of Elon Musk, like in in the oh. movies. Like he based you know, his character. In one of the movies too. Was about to say, I'm, which I'm makes sense if you think about it. Here's the thing: uh, recently they rewrote Tony Stark's origin. So Howard Stark isn't his father. His father is mm. like the Watcher or somebody. He's a demigod now. So that's kind of interesting. But yeah, I do. We mentioned that in the pre-show too. That I, I I get that question every time I mention L in a video. I get. 15 fucking comments. It's like, did you just talk about the House of L? Cal L? Superman's Cal -El. God. And I'm like, yeah. literally, yes. He was written yeah, by Jewish immigrants. Let's and get into that. Let's get into that. But Cal L. <laughs> Why is that? Let's talk it, about it. It literally means um, the voice of God, I think. Well, the voice of L, I should say. Um, and they, they did. They named him They named him and his family after L. Elyon, after so, uh, so wait, uh, me... the biblical L. So Superman is basically the third gospel because we have the gospel of the son, which is, sorry, the gospel of the father is the Old Testament. Gospel of the father, sorry, gospel of the father, Old Testament. Gospel of the son is the New Testament. Well, what about the gospel of the Holy Spirit, Superman? So I think that's evidence that the Christian religion is mythology because it just shows that you can evolve, you know, Judaism into Christianity and then you can evolve Christianity into Superman, which is completely a myth. And it's it's so interesting that that uh, uh, Cal L uh, translates to the voice of God because the uh, the angels that were fallen from heaven in the Book of Enoch 
uh, they all have L at the end of their name. And I think like Azazel uh, means the strength of God. And then there's uh, another one. It's like the wisdom of God, the strength of God. And I have the voice of God uh, and the intention of God. And there's, there's all these other terms that mean like, some, some aspect of L's character uh, is represented by these deities that fell from heaven. And then Superman is just one is, is the next one. Uh, so yeah. How interesting is that? <laughs> you almost see that as like a division of L. Um, yeah. Hell, uh, um, in uh, Full Metal Alchemist, the father uh, um, is the little spirit in the jar that is now a twin of Edward and Alphonse Elric's uh, um, actual father, and he splits his consciousness. He splits his, you know, his soul and his philosopher stones into however many vessels that are all different. Um, cardinal sins, or the deadly sins, I should say. So, envy, greed, gluttony, pride, sloth, wrath. Lust. I feel like I missed one. Lust. Lust. Yeah, they're all. So he takes them out of himself. So he's the perfect being, and then all of them are are aspects of his personality. You could almost see if Elion didn't exist anymore, if he sacrificed himself to make the angels, that that would be why they're all given to have aspects of him. And then if Samael is an agent of El Elyon, this I still consider this nerding out, by the way. If Samael then is the venom of El as the devil, who, again, just doing his job in Jewish dogma, like he literally cries when he succeeds at corrupting a human. Samael cries. The poor boy. He's such a good, good boy. He does not deserve the hate. Anyway. Um, I don't know. That's really that's kind of an interesting thought Not experiment. Just a poor boy from a poor family. Sorry. <laughs> um, superheroes, though. So, give me a favorite, because mine mine is uh, uh, either the Punisher or Ghost Rider. I'm not sure which. I like the religious aspects of Ghost Rider, but the Punisher is just so satisfying. Fucking Thomas Jane in the movie was amazing. Best casting. For me, uh, I think most people uh, know by now it's the Red Hood. Uh, who is the second uh, Robin to Batman. Uh, and he is chaotic evil. He was killed by Joker, but was resurrected in the Lazarus pit. And when he came back, he had like some uh, certain supernatural abilities. Uh, and he basically just, yeah, it was chaotic evil. He like the Punisher, very much like the Punisher. Um, he's, he's my personal favorite. I mean, chaotic uh, good. Cause you keep saying evil. Do I say evil? evil? No, it's chaotic I good. Would... Sorry. Okay. Yeah, it's chaotic. My so, bad. <laughs> the Joker would be chaotic evil. Sorry if I said evil. It's chaotic good, um, which is also my uh, D my D and D character is pretty much based off him. But yeah, um, Piper, your turn. Wow, my turn on a superhero. Well, your favorite superhero. To honest, yeah, to be honest, my favorite superhero, who's probably not a legit superhero, would be Neil from the Matrix. I mean, he's considered a superhero in a way. Um, if sure. I had to pick an you know, because um, he's an average person who reaches, you know, some sort of uh, complex in the world that becomes a superhero. And, oh, you know, the Matrix is amazing. It is. It is. I love the Matrix. And Neo is kind of like this this guy who is kind of like the Jesus prototype. If you can activate your soul and your mind. Right. Anybody can become Neo in the Matrix. Anyone can become lucid in the dream. But so if I, I had to pick it. Sorry, go ahead. I, 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 I know someone. Uh, who does who made the license plates for the Matrix movies? Really? Um, I bet this was decades ago. I I don't know. Who, I don't know where they are now. Uh, but he, uh, the license plates in the Matrix trilogy, uh, they're all Bible verses. Oh. Uh, and I, I know the person who made those. Um, the the entire Matrix trilogy is supposed to be like an allegory or, or representation of um, of you know, Christianity, like the idea that we are, we are in this like illusion. And then the one comes who is going to come again and, uh, freeze us. Uh, but our, our freed life, uh, looks way more impoverished, uh, than our disillusioned life. Um, so yeah, the, the entirety of the matrix is, is based off of Christian, uh, sort of mythology. Um, so yeah, this, this is my fun flex for the night. It is, but it's also a trans allegory written by two trans sisters who weren't out at the time. Um, so the concept of taking the pills to become your true self, those pills represent estrogen. 
Like they've confirmed that this is true. The Wachowski sisters confirmed I've, that they're like, it's 100% a trans allegory. I haven't heard um, this. Oh yeah, it's great. Uh, uh, and so that's even the point though, is like you can be happy in the lie or you can be miserable, but live your truth. Um, it's very, very LGBTQ coded. There's even a character named Switch and in the original concept of uh, um, mm -hmm. the Matrix, she was supposed to be female in real life, but male in the movie, and they cut that shit. Or, or sorry, female in real life, but male in the Matrix, I should say. I said movie. See, now I'm going to have to rewatch the entire trilogy. So wait, wait, wait. This, like, this, actually, been, like... this builds ahead, in the little Nas's ex's music video, because in his music video, oh, he's shit. hated <laughs> little Nas. Here, here we go. Ready, ready? Little Nas is hated Nos for who he is, okay? The Christian religion taught him his whole life that because of who he was born, that he's gonna go to hell. So what does little Nas do? He goes to hell and he confronts his inner demons, his inner shadow self. He confronts the devil and the demiurge himself and all of the evil and hatred and jealousy in this world, he confronts in hell. And then he dethrones the devil. He kills him. And then Little Nas in the music video embraces who he is. He gives the devil a lap dance and kills him and puts on the crowns. And you know what that symbolizes? Taking power of who you are and not giving a fuck what society says, overcoming the demiurge, the devil, and unleashing enlightenment. Little Nas went to hell, beat the devil, and rose from the dead, metaphorically like Jesus did. And everyone should go into them to their internal psyches, find out what you're suppressing, whatever it is, desires, emotions, accomplishments, goals, unearth them, fight, slay your dragons like the dragon of revelation, and then overcome your inner desires and rise from the dead and become who you were meant to be. You know, I'm, be I'm just saying the truth. I'm just saying death by lap dance. Uh, that, that's how I want to go. It was that's very, what, yeah, right? death by lap dance. Is there a way we can arrange that? Is like, is there, is there a list I can like put my name on? Our favorite uh, uh, cowardly lion, Damon Andy, made a video oh, talking oh. about the shoes. And he, in it, he admitted, or he said rather, I was like, you were, you were smart, Andy, do that again. He said that it was a marketing stunt and that it's just a pair of shoes and that people need to let it go. And I was like, okay, you're half right. Because it, whether or not he did it for the publicity, there's no such thing as bad publicity, it's marketing, all that. He also did it because he's a gay man. And as a gay man, he was abused by the church. And so this was his way of taking a strike back. So you can't, like, pretending that that's not the case is reductive. You're like, oh, it's solely a marketing stunt. Oh, it's solely for the publicity. No. He had a message in that that wasn't just me trying to money grab, making money. No, it oh, had yeah. nothing to do with that. No, it, it's, it's, about getting your, it's about getting your power back. It's about controlling you. It's, it's the idea that the Christian religion doesn't understand. They're the devil worshipers to everyone who isn't a Christian. To the LGBTQ community who gets condemned to hell because of who they are, like the Christians are the devils. They're the ones who are telling you that you're condemned for just being you. They're the evil ones. You're, the LGBTQ community is just being who they were meant to be. They're being them. There's nothing wrong with it. It's fine. Yet, yet, so the idea is that he's conquering the devil, which is actually conquering the Christian religion in its in and of itself. Put that on a shirt. You got a merch store. You need to put Christians are the devil worshippers to non Christians. You need to put that on a shirt. That would sell. I would buy one. You would buy um, one. Okay, I'll do it. I'm, because do fuck, you know, I'm sure we see it constantly. All three of us. The things that they want to try to justify in our comments where I'm like, I did the videos on numbers 31 and I had dozens of people being like, you don't get it. You don't, you lack the context. The Medianites were evil. And I'm like, oh, so two rights make a wrong because in the 21st century, we tell our kids that two rights don't make a, or two wrongs don't make a right rather. Did I say two rights make a wrong? I fucking did. Two wrongs don't make a right. I'm not that drunk. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, you know, sure about that? that ties back to, okay, why are you comparing the morality of 2000 years ago to the morality of today? Because they want to pretend like it's the same. They want to pretend like they have objective morality and then it comes from God through the Bible. But the Bible shows that Yahweh condones rape, slavery, and murder. So then you bring that up and they're like, well, those people were evil. They deserved it. You're going to hell. If hell exists... You're going there for having said that. 
That's going to be like number one on the fucking ticket list when you're there and the accountants that's, is like, that's this why is the why Gnostics were killed. They, they called the Christians devil worshipers and they were, what happened to them? Well, they were killed. So you're, uh, Hyper, <laughs> you're saying that the, the, I'm out of, the Christians yeah, who I'm had more of a Gnostic off. leaning uh, were killed. Um, in order to prevent the, them spreading Turn that down for what? ideology. Yes. Yeah, that, that, uh, can you say that again? Shit, I'm out. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I say, could you go again? I didn't hear you. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get it. Sorry, they, they put the thing on, I just make the noise go. Yeah. We we're supposed to be nerding out. We're still uh, talking about the fucking Bible. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> So all that to say is uh, Superman is uh, a sort of type of uh, Nazi Germany and uh, uh, is, is uh, yeah, he's a typology of Hitler and uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Here's okay. Okay. There we go. I'm <laughs> talking around. Wait, I'm fucking around. Wait, okay. I'm kidding, he brought I'm it kidding. up. I, wait, for the record, he I did not bring this up, but he, here's a conspiracy now. Hear me out. Hear me bring out. Up? Okay, great. <laughs> so I've heard it argued before that Hitler was the avatar of Yahweh. Uh, okay, Yahweh continue. makes his people continue. suffer. Continue. And Shut up, Mason. Shut the fuck up. Continue. Because <laughs> Yahweh had the chosen people. Hitler had the master race. Okay? Yahweh in the Bible told the Jews he was going to eradicate and punish them. Well, what did Hitler do? He tried to eradicate and punish the Jews. Now, I would never support right? Killing or attacking anybody for any reason. But when we look at it, Hitler was one of the most evil people, right? He was doing genocide. Well, who else does genocide in religion? Yahweh. So is there any difference between Yahweh of the Old Testament killing people who weren't worshiping him and Hitler of Germany? They technically both kind of did the same thing. They had the chosen people and the master race, you know, I mean, they had their prophets and their, their SSS army. They had their, the star of David. They had, you know, all these things are kind of equal. Yeah. Hitler said the great prophets, the greatest liars are magicians. Well, weren't all the prophets of the Old Testament magicians? So how, how about Joseph Stalin then? Was that the same, like along the same vein of thought? Stalin um, killed his own people, man. Yeah, he did but be, because he. Yeah, sorry. No, I know. Yeah. I'm just like. No, I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying I've I've heard that conspiracy theory. Yeah, no, that's I have not yeah. heard that conspiracy. Which Hitler is has interesting. I'm hearing it for the first time numbers compared to Stalin. What I would say is like if so, there are people who believe that through suffering they are achieving their salvation. That that suffering is the method by which they prove their love for God. It it ties back to Job, and it's like I suffer. That's as the people Job that like flog themselves and shit. Stockholm syndrome. Uh, yeah. so in that, in that essence, if Yahweh was to make the You're Jews no suffer comments. through Hitler, that'd be a pretty good way to make them suffer. This video might get taken down for this fucking bit right here. Nothing else that we said, just, the, just the Hitler stuff. The, the, the thing is all it takes is for evil to prevail in this world is for good people to do nothing. So when we look at God, if he's real Classic. in the Abrahamic religions to change the subject, um, God is silent in the face of evil. All it takes is for evil to prevail is for people to do nothing. God does nothing in the face of evil. He doesn't help. He doesn't intervene. He, he doesn't participate. He does nothing. So one would only conclude he accepts it. He wants it. You know, there's the analogy where the guy's drowning in the water and he prays to God to save him. And so God sends him a boat and the guy goes, no, I reject the boat. God's going to save me. A second boat comes. He says the same thing. And then the guy ends up drowning, dies, goes to heaven and say, God, why didn't you save me? And God goes, I sent you two boats, you moron. Well, maybe we are the gods and devils. Maybe we're the ones that are supposed to end racism, sexism, homophobia on the planet. It's us. God lives inside us. We're the gods. Gods are constructs of humans. And as a Gnostic or as humans, it's up to us to end the evils on planet Earth. Why does why does evil prevail? Because humans are lazy and they sit by and watch evil go down and they don't do anything. I think world star hip hop is proof. Of that, that. That's similar to a, a video I made recently where they were like, there uh, someone is Pastor Block who was like, "There's no true atheist," and I, and I responded was like, "There's no true Christian." If you actually believed that everyone who believes differently than you is going to spend an eternity eternity in 
hellfire, you would be driving yourself mad trying to, you would spend all of your time, all of your energy, all of your money, all of your resources trying to tell everyone uh, the message that you have, uh, but you don't. You sit at home, you play video games, you watch movies, you don't give a shit. Uh, so there's no real true Christian. Like if, if this was really something you actually believed, yeah, you, you'd be driving yourself crazy trying to convince people of this truth. But of course they don't because they don't actually believe it. Yep. It's an aesthetic. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a form of social affirmation and that's it. And they don't even realize it. You guys, we have a, a question here. Yep. Um, I have no idea. Stalin. Um, so here's the thing about Hades. Hades is no different from like we were talking about Samael. Hades isn't evil just because he's the god of the underworld. Um, he So like the, the account of Hades in like Disney's Hercules where it's like, oh, I want to be king of the cosmos. Nothing to do with Hades in mythology. Hades is happy with his lot. Um, they drew straws to see who would be lord of the skies, the seas, and the underworld. And uh, Hades got the short end of the stick, as it were, but he was fine with it. Um, so, I, like, I wouldn't necessarily say any of the sort. I don't, I don't know anything about the Percy Jackson mythos. Um, if World War II is a war between those three groups, that's odd because the Axis powers are, like, essentially three big names, and then the uh, uh, Allies are essentially three big names. So I don't, I don't know. Um, you only gave me three, and there should be six. Can I throw in, like, Athena and Ares and Hera? So all, all that to say, superheroes uh, are, are a type of, of Christ. That's what we're, that's the point we're trying to get out of here. They are. Messiah's, the Messiah complex is the idea that somebody externally from you will come and save you. Yet if God is inside you, then you are the savior. So the Messiah complex is people who are slaves, docile and submissive, waiting for a superhero. You're exactly right. All superheroes are the Messiah complex projected into Hollywood movies. It's the exact same thing. They're Jesus Christ. Most of them. They're, they're written by the, the Jews, which at the time especially dominated uh, our, our, our well, uh, all of them. Yeah, you're you're talking about Wonder Superman Woman. Right they're, all, they're, all, they're, all, they're all saviors. It's yeah. entirely possible. Sorry. Um, I didn't, you know, <laughs> we're kind of fading on this. Uh, shame on us. And, and you know what? Rachel's very good with the button. I'll say that. How about that? That uh, uh, Did I play it last time? She's born for micromanaging, let me tell you. Fair enough. Don't forget to smash the like button. That's funny. I'm getting um, the look right now. So. so I'm trying to think of like. So there are a number of superheroes that even have the initials JC on purpose or not even superheroes, but like just movie figures, his, uh, uh, certain things. And it's like, it's intentional to like reference Christ. John Constantine is one of them. Oh yeah. Um, I can't brain today. I have the drunk. You do have Woo! the drunk. This was a fun topic one way or the other. Like, I'm glad that we had this talk. Um, so, so hyper, do you, do you want to take over? Is there anything else you were trying to say about this? whole topic since you're clearly not nearly as drunk as we are so um no i think that was kind of it I, I think that the superhero complex is kind of the messiah complex you know people in hollywood movies are captivated especially we see a lot of tiktoks these days of people saying look at hunger games you know truth in plain sight look at the simpsons people are looking to fairy tales to save them they're looking to mythology right they're they're rebelling mm -hmm. from the government and from stuff they don't like and they turn people are stupid so instead of turning to the truth like a gnostic they turn to religion or in modern day we see a lot of these conspiracy theories of like the dome over the earth because the hunger game shoots an arrow up and there's a that that's you know the truth hiding in plain sight because cathedine in the hunger game shatters the you know the stadium none of it's true so we see this religious mindset that develops in people when the when the when religions are breaking down i think what we're witnessing in the modern day world is the end of christianity in the western world and people instead of following jesus and reading the bible are trained to conspiracy theories and that's why we see the rise of flat earth and aliens run the planet and superheroes is because people are leaving religion and they, and a lot of people they can't be atheists they need meaning they need religion they need something to tell mm -hmm. them that life is greater than, than nihilism of no meaning because 
as most Christians claim, they start murdering people if the Bible is false. And I believe them. So they have to go somewhere. So I think the rise of conspiracy theories is the rise of the end of Christianity at the same time. And Christians like to say, no, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. Well, the Roman Empire fell when it was at the height. The Egyptian Empire fell when it was at the height. All empires like religions fall when they're at the height. So Christianity being the biggest religion in the world is actually might be irrefutable evidence that it's about to be be eradicated and fall and decline because all empires fall when they're at the top. And if Christianity is at the top, then its time is up and it's time to fall. Yeah, Michael. just because the, the church is on the decline doesn't necessarily mean that atheism is on the rise. Uh, mm -hmm. People are finding answers like the whole QAnon. Like they don't realize it, but they've abandoned their religion. They they would never say that out loud, but they have, and they're now uh, uh, associating themselves with this like bizarre conspiracy theory, uh, and it all ties into how our our brains. Uh, uh, are designed to or hardwired to recognize patterns. Um, and that's what people are doing. They're, they're trying to, okay, let me, let me try and find my own patterns here. And then they hear all these conspiracy theories. So now you have all these other, uh, and, and the, with the conspiracy theory itself seems to be a religion, like in religion, there's all these denominations of certain religion, you know, in conspiracy theory, there's all these denominations within the conspiracy theory. So now we're moving away from religion and we're moving towards like a, a centralist conspiracy theory esque uh, ideology um, where everyone's kind of like drawing from different patterns that they think they've recognized from the internet research that they've done. So, um, uh, I saw that Crimson stitched the same video that I did about that guy who made the video about earth being a flat and he was a christian and said it was a dome and he posted mm -hmm. this meme that was on the internet of all these ancient cultures that depicted earth as the firmament and with the the four the four corners in the earth right and i made a video making fun of it saying no earth is a triangle right because we have triangles all throughout everywhere we have the pyramids and the pyramids are we have the pyramid earth and we have pyramids in mecca and and everywhere right they're in every culture so the thing is there these guys are when they they need help and Gnosticism can actually be help because it's a logos knowledge based religion and it can help liberate these mentally insane fairy tale based religions that are hating on people because of a fairy tale book. You know, logos religion is the antidote to fairy tale religion, not necessarily atheism because most people would go mentally insane with atheism, right? They, you have to be, mm -hmm. I love atheism, but you have to, you, you guys are superior to religious people. You have to be very mentally strong to be an atheist, right? Cause you have to stand on your own. And most people can't do that. I don't think they they have it within them to, to stand on their own. They need Stop. religion. <laughs> that, you know, so Druidism in its intended form, which I, 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 every show i say i hate other druids i do is you know truth seeking knowledge seeking it it is i i would say from what our talk today i would call it a gnostic religion in that you're not no, supposed is. to put any sort of special importance on the celtic gods the gallic gods or anybody um with the exception of danu who is the earth herself we can see danu we're standing on her um and so whether or not she has any sort of personification or will or consciousness consciousness it's our home and we should take care of it we have to if we want to continue our species self-preservation at its finest um but uh, outside of that like the concept of any sort of afterlife or or uh, um, pre-life uh, um, karma uh, uh resurrection not resurrection but like reincarnation all of that is is theory and to like posit that any of it is true because of what was said in celtic mythology is uh, um, like the antithesis of Druidry it really is, but you, then you have Druids who take it that way and you're like, I hate you. Uh, <laughs> um, I was going somewhere with this. Maybe I am a tad drunk. Sorry. Um, um, <laughs> fuck me sideways. God damn it. I had a I response and I lost it. Sorry. I did. Oh, we're all okay. Hold on. It happens. We're talking it happens. About something and then something about jesus uh, religion maybe um druid Dru gnostic gnostic druidism I'm, I'm i would well that's you know so there's the concept <laughs> of agnosticism which is without knowledge but it's like well i don't know but i'm not going to assume i don't know um i, I need to uh, uh look into those terms a little bit more and come to a, a, 
an agreement on it within myself. But so all, all, all this, know, all this to it. say, um, hyper going back to you, what do you think is happening? Um, with the church today, because you mentioned, yeah, the church is, is, um, you know, is, is losing members, yeah. uh, statistically. So what, what do you think is happening, uh, overall? So, there were two articles I read that had actual data on this. I don't have them open cause I wasn't expecting this question, but one, the church of Ireland, which, which 90% of people in Ireland used to go to the Catholic church is now down to like 20%. The church of England is also on a massive decline. And it's estimated that the church of England might actually close in the next 50 years. If the Catholic churches start to shut down, you will see the end of Christianity. The Catholicism, the Catholic churches were the philosophical backbones and the most intelligent parts with Thomas Aquinas and the philosophers like of the Christian religion. If the Catholic church is done and starts to decline, you will see Christianity, the whole thing will end. Progressive Christianity cannot take Christianity onto the future. They're, they just can't do it. So if the Catholic churches fall and the churches in Europe fall, we will see that we'll witness the decline of Christianity, maybe in the next 200, 100 years. So I, I, I love that you said I was not prepared for this question. And then you were like, Thomas Aquinas said, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. Year, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> I, I talk about this in my lives on, on TikTok. That's why I kind of have it in my head. Cause I, I talked about this recently, the, the decline of the Ireland church and the England church, but it's, there are articles written about the decline of the churches in Europe and, how it's a startling thing for all of Christianity because the people say the Catholic churches are all evil. And no, if the Catholic churches, which underpin all of Christianity declines, there goes the whole bedrock and foundation of Christianity. See, I, I, I did, I did not have my finger on the pulse of what's happening in other countries. Um, so that's like really average, interesting. The article said the average person that goes to church in Europe in a Catholic church is age 60 or over. What that tells us is the young people are not Catholic. They're not going to church. And when those people who are 60 turn 70, 80, and then they die in 20 years from now, it's over. It'll be eradicated. We'll see a massive decline. And when the churches shut down, the money shuts down, the popes, the churches, the websites shut down, the missionaries shut down, the charities shut down, the religion declines, and we see the end of Christianity. I'm here for I'm it. I'm slightly worried that uh, Islam might take its place because Islam is like on the rise. Yeah. However, like I don't think that that'll necessarily happen in more stable countries. Like I get that there are Muslims here in America. I don't think they're going to replace Christians. I think that Gen Z being raised in uh, um, the social media like environment knows better. I think that's what it is. I think they know better that the truth is either atheism or some other form of spiritualism and not Abrahamism itself um, or even any organized religion. Um, I, I think that they are more capable of thinking for themselves because they're sort of linked into the entirety of human consciousness from a young age. And I enjoy that. I, I, I like seeing it. I think it was true of millennials to an extent, but we were a little more susceptible to, uh, uh, being influenced by our parents, whereas Gen Z being raised by millennials has that sort of uh, um, fuck spiritual advantage, I would say. Um, I don't think so I, I don't think Islam is going anywhere, which I hate to say, uh, but it's a, it's it's the the hard truth because it not only is it illegal, but it's often punishable by death for leaving the religion or becoming an apostate. Uh, so. They they have solidified that um, they, they've just subscribed to having half of their followers to being closet atheists, um, but they'll never come out because they could die if they do. Ninety nine percent of everybody in Afghanistan is is in is a Muslim. Yeah, ninety nine percent. That just tells you people are closet atheists. They just they can't. Yeah. They can't do it. Uh, so yeah, I think while while Christianity uh, will fall by the wayside because it is legally allowed to. Um, Islam will, will not because yeah, yeah, you could fucking be killed by your government for doing so, uh, which is something they're going to bring up. And they're like, oh, Islam or, or uh, Christianity is, is, is dying, but Islam is, is still remaining strong. Like, yeah, because you're going to get fucking killed if you yeah. leave it. So, so yeah. I'm glad that we brought that up. 
that needs I to see be a window. I see a window here in modern day human rights because you know our constitution bill of rights in America really hasn't been updated in a long time. Religion still mixes with state. I see a civil rights and human rights movement here that could potentially change America. And what I mean by that is we could update our laws to with the decline of Christianity with, if people do support it to completely separate religion from state erratic, make circumcision illegal, which would make Christianity and both Islam illegal right? You cannot indoctrinate kids before the age of 16. You can teach anybody Islam or Christianity. It's it's fair game. But I don't think kids, I think indoctrination into religion is brainwashing and is against the child rights. I think we need to, we need to come up with a constitution of children rights in the modern day world that protects them from the abuse of their parents religiously or physically or racially, whatever. And that could end the Abrahamic religions altogether. And that has nothing to do with religion, has everything to do with modern day human rights and politics. Well, hell, now we're getting into the political side here. Uh, uh, oh, Thomas shit. Jefferson did not think that the Constitution should be eternal, should be permanent. He thought that we should update it every 19 years. And we've had the same Constitution yep. for over yeah. 200, uh, uh, almost 250 now, right? Something like that. Hold on. Anyway, the, uh, irrelevant. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's the he wrote it. He wrote the damn thing, and he's like, "We should update this every 19 years." And we kind of do in the form of amendments, but like, fuck, we really need to rewrite the Constitution because it mentions the three fifths compromise and slavery. Like, let's just redo that shit yeah. in in common parlance in today's language, so that it, there's no fucking second guessing or or uh, um, need for interpretation necessarily, even so. I don't know. And there, there, there should be things that I, I personally feel, and this is my opinion, that religions should not be allowed to do. I think concepts like if you hate the LGBTQ community, that should be illegal, especially if human rights are passed all across the U.S. That it's legal to do that, right? That should that should be illegal to have a religion that hates on a sexual orientation, a race, or a culture. And secondly, to abuse children should also be illegal, right? And to indoctrinate people should not be allowed. Now, I believe in religious freedom at the age of consent, which is 16 or 18 or 21, whatever the government could decide on, and then people can do whatever they want. But these religions survive of hate and jealousy and anger because everyone's indoctrinated from when they're a little kid. And I think that a monotheistic creator God religion of our religion is true, all religions are false, should also be illegal. You have to be accepting of other religions and understand that your religion isn't verified or proven. Therefore, you can't actually make a religious claim that it's true unless you can, I'm an, a scientific idealist, so I'm not a materialist, but you have to at least prove that your religion and your God is true before you can claim that it's the one true religion. Otherwise, that claim, in my opinion, not an atheist, by the way, I think should be illegal. I, I agree wholeheartedly, I think, so that even my kids, I'm not going to, uh, um, like, I'm going to open the door for them, but I want them to explore all avenues, and I'm going to give them the information. So I'm like, you know, they claim that this is true, however, but I'll do that for mine, too. It's like, uh, uh, I personally have a certain view of Celtic mythology, and it doesn't have to be true because it's irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter. Uh, um, at the end of the day, all I'm about is uh, um, custodianship of the planet as far as environmentalism goes. Um, so that's my religion. It's like, oh, well, you know, is it non-theistic? Anyway, irrelevant. But, but it, the point is to like provide your children the tools to make those kinds of decisions for themselves rather than indoctrinate them into one thing in particular. Um, but at the same time, you know, well, eh, anyway. Sorry. So uh, we're uh, we've been at it for about two hours and twenty minutes. Um, oh, I'm sure we, we should keep going. Should start wrapping another. things up. Yeah. Uh, as much as I hate to, because I think we could do this for an, another couple hours. Um, but so uh, hyper. Before we close out, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, anything else you want to plug? I know, I know you have a book coming out, or you're you're in the process of writing a book. Uh, yeah. So you um, don't talk about any of that. Um, I'm working on a book called it's basically the case for the Bible God being the devil. And it's just the idea is to start a movement where we can people in the modern day world can understand where a lot of the source of evil comes from. And it comes from these imaginary evil deities that people create in religion. And we can see through the Old Testament slavery, sexism, racism basically was the motivation for a lot of the things that happened in the past. And it's the people claiming immoral is morality and, you know, confusing the two. So it's a book on 
the Bible God is either the Abrahamic God is the devil, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Um, secondly, I have merch coming out. I have a really badass t-shirt sweatshirt coming out that says God is a mass murderer, and it's got the Bible verses on the back of the confirmed kills. Is the bit about him sicking bears on children in there? It Should is, be. it is. And I'm gonna have I'm gonna have God nice. kill babies and children as well, and God is immoral and all the immoral acts he does. I'm gonna have variations of it. Those I think those sell well because there are there's a subset of atheists that uh, um, oh this is gonna get me in trouble that do um, they want that shock value because that is shock value for anybody who believes in God oh, yeah. to have that on a shirt, um, which you know it's true. Fuck like it doesn't matter if it is shock value is, or not. It it's is true. true. It's con I got but, confirmed uh, killed um, in the back. I mean, yeah. I did. I liked what you said earlier. The uh, um, fuck I told you to put it on a shirt and I can't remember what it was. I'm gonna have to go oh, watch the uh, tapes. That, that Chris Christians are devil worshippers to people who are not Christian. That's because because we, look at the story, we look at the story of Abraham, right? Isaac, Abraham's son. If let's say Isaac worshipped a different god, well, being tied up in your on your kitchen table and having your father pick up a dagger and fake murder you for the obedience of his god, Abraham's god becomes the devil to Isaac. Isaac is his human rights are are, are broken. He's tied up against his will. He's got no child rights, and he doesn't believe in Yahweh. So. Yahweh becomes the devil to Isaac, right? He becomes the biggest nightmare. Isaac is scarred for life. So in a way, yeah, Chris, you know, we can, as agnostics, we can be the gods or the goddesses or the devils. And if you worship a jealous, angry, hateful God, you become a hateful, jealous, angry person. It's basic logic. Oh, Dustin wants you to be mad, Ricky. He asked if you got your shirts yet. Yeah, I, I, I have not. And oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where the fuck is, is, is the hold up. Didn't you say it could be like till the end of this month into Yeah, uh, I'm like uh, why? Maybe? I ordered I ordered my shit the day we opened the store and everyone's got Mine said before Mine said it could take week. 4 to 6 weeks and I got them in like a week and a half. So I don't know, yeah, it's so, spring, man. This is my life. This is the way my life works. I don't know why I expected anything different. Um <laughs> Sorry. And my fault. Um I had nothing to do with this. So uh, this is really fun, um, Hyper. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, maybe we'll have you back on in the future sometime. Um, but yeah, I was super appreciate you coming on and sharing uh, your, your knowledge with us. Maybe when your book uh, comes out. Yeah, let yeah. us know. Yeah. It was great to meet both you guys and finally, you know, formally meet you guys and be on uh, YouTube. Yeah. It's been great. You know, I know we, we have the same followers and a lot of people in the same groups on TikTok. So it's been great to meet you guys and finally talk. And you guys are really cool. So I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things about having this YouTube channel is I actually get to interact with the people that I follow and that I like uh, on and you, on a TikTok and learn about them. So I, I super enjoyed uh, getting to do that with you. Um, so yeah, anyone who's watching who doesn't know... Um, Hyper Humanity is on TikTok. Look him up. He's got a lot of good information. He brings a lot of knowledge and uh, energy to the app. Um, and I highly recommend him. New oh, name uh, is like attack, Gnostic Abraxas, right? Yeah, the, the reason for the new TikTok account yeah, is I, I got a 40-day ban from posting. 40 days? So what happened was I got banned for 10 days. And then I came back and whenever I get banned, I private my account and hope I don't get deleted because my first account got deleted. So I got banned for 10 days. Then I privated it, made it public, posted four videos. Okay. After two days, got another 10 day block of posting, posted, waited one day after the 10 day block, posted two videos. The next day I had another 10 day block. So now we're in the 30. Then I posted four videos about little or no, two videos about Lil Nas. And I waited and I got a 10 day block and i'm like i'm just gonna leave my account this time on public fuck it and i got three more just recently updates saying you're blocked for 10 more days for 10 more days for 10 more days you and know I'm like wow. it's just it, it's in, i don't know what i didn't even make any new videos and i had no videos taken down for hate speech and i don't know why i'm getting i don't know what's it, going on people are reporting like your comments and your replies and certain things and it's like yeah. tiktok needs to start taking fake reports seriously because they're just reporting you and they're claiming it's hate speech because you're you're bad mouthing their god and they don't like it, even though you're not saying anything about them in particular, or you know. And so it's like yeah. you need to start taking that serious. When people make a report and it turns out to be bullshit, they need to suffer repercussions for that. And what's funny it is I have, 
I have the until opposite. it does, it's just gonna keep fucking doing it. I have the opposite problem as most people. I have old videos that go viral. So I had one video that was on fifty thousand views, and it in a matter of two days it went to six hundred thousand. And I that's why probably my account got blocked is because that video and i i don't want those views like i'm good with a hundred thousand so i'm like trying not to get views because too many views too quickly gets too many reports too quickly gets your account muted so i'm at this weird point where i'm not trying to go viral but still trying to get people to see my content it's kind of weird it's a you know it's a weird finesse it, it's so weird because i i have yet to be banned and you, you are the I, mystery, I have like man. i have like three hundred and thirty thousand followers now I mean, and I, I, I've yet to be banned, and I don't know why. I fully yeah. expected to be shadow banned by now, but it just hasn't happened. Like I, I had my live stream shut down at one point. I just had my shut down yesterday for ten days. Yeah, that, that's the worst that has happened to me. So I don't, I don't understand why I, I have avoided the guillotine, so to speak, for so yeah. long. I got banned for two days, and I came back up. Like they reversed the decision. And it wasn't even for like any of my religious content. It was something about math. And I don't remember exactly. I think it was like a flat earth type video yeah. thing where I, I was, I told a guy, I, I was like, I dumbed down my voice and I, like I was talking to a toddler and they were like, that video got taken down and was deleted. But then like he reported the other ones and they banned my account. So I, I did find something out. TikTok, the, the algorithm will, will factor in the, re, the amount of reports you get to the amount of likes. That's 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 what I work with this guy who helps me grow yeah. my account. He tells me smaller accounts get videos taken down because TikTok will weigh the reports with the likes. So if you have a massive account like Dadpool that's got 3 million likes, you're almost, ve you're very secure. You have a great foundation. But if you have a smaller account with 20,000 likes, you're very risky to get banned because TikTok does not see you as someone who has great content, who's been around for a while. So they're more likely to kick you off than a guy who's got more likes. So it's all about likes, not followers, not views, but likes is how you stay alive. This yeah, because, because ultimately, ago. ultimately I am making TikTok money. So they they are they are more hesitant to ban me. Yeah. Um, which is what I've deduced. And I've not joined the creator fund because I don't, I don't, I don't think with my content I would survive. So I've tried to stay under the radar. It's, it's yeah, not I'm, even, not I'm, in I'm in the creator fund. I make one to three dollars a day. If, yeah, if if that. So it's 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 not even worth it. Like I'll I'll get like thirty or forty dollars a month from the I creator feel like fund. Unless you're doing like funny content, like your Call Me Chris or something, it's not worth it. Um, yeah, I. I don't know. I, you know, I think we're better off like trying to do the YouTube thing and selling shirts and whatnot, or at least. Oh yeah. We've, we've, we've made more money from our merch store than I've made from the creator fund on TikTok already. Um, so yeah, super appreciate you guys. Um, okay, cool. right. next week we're supposed to have, um, Boston and Lilith. Huh? Wait, I got it. I got no, next week we have Nat on. Next week is Nat. I thought next week was Buff Metal and Lilith is right, next and then the twenty fifth is next week is Baff and Mel. Baff and Mel, then Kevin. Nat seems. Nat told me she's next week. I think Nat might be confused. Nat, Nat, uh, Nat, Nat are you still on the, you're still in the she's comments? Not, she left a while ago. Okay, uh, well, I'll have to DM her. Okay, so next week we have uh, we have Baff and Mel. Yeah. Baff and Metal and uh, Lilith was right six six six, and they. I don't, I don't know what their topic was. They were going to talk about Satanism, but then we have Kevin on, and you said they were going to decide what to do. I don't know if they've gotten back to you yet. Yeah, they, they haven't uh, gotten back to me about that, but um, still, they're going to be on. They have their own podcast, um, the Garden of, Garden Burning, of Eden, or Burning Eden uh, podcast. Um, I, I was on like their second episode of their podcast that they ever did, um, so I'm it's, it's cool that I can now have them on my show. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. I think next next week is going to be very uh, um, it, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Extravagant or flamboyant or <laughs> extra. <laughs> ne next week's going to be extra. We're going to be doing the most next week. I don't know what we're going to be talking about. But it's going to be a fun time, one way or the other. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. And then yeah, they're two very fun people. Is it the 25th? Is, yeah, it should be the 25th is the week after. And that's Kevin Blixen's. And that will be the topic on Satanism. 
Um, probably yeah. Levian Satanism specifically. It's going to be interesting. Our, our first black guy. So we can. Okay. We can finally <laughs> say no, no. We we can finally say our podcast isn't racist. We've had a black guest on. Just that's some shit a racist would say. <laughs> I do. I do. I want. I'm excited uh, to see him on. I want more, more people of color, more women, because we're fucking white as the driven snow, and so yeah. you know. Um, we got. We got Lil on. We got Nat on. on. Our first guest was June. You know, so. So I think I think I we're doing okay in the diversity department. Yes. Department. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can do better. Oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, yeah, uh, we're going to wrap things up here. Appreciate all you guys who joined in. Uh, the comments were super entertaining. I, I appreciate you guys uh, contributing in there. Um, hi, Bert, thank you so much for coming. This was fun getting to actually meet you uh, in person and interact with you. Um, so, yeah, um, we're going to end things here. And uh, thank, you, thank you guys for joining. Thank you.